Hey everyone, I'm Cody Seipert and welcome to a full stack tutorial where I'm going to show you how to build a front end single page application using Vue.js um, and also using Vuex as our state store. And then that's going to connect to a back end written in Adonis.js basically to create our REST API. And then I'm going to deploy this on DigitalOcean after we finish. And so let me just show you really quick what I'm going to be building. Basically, it's a very simple to do list application. Woohoo! Um, in the left, we have projects, so we can click different projects here to change. Um, we can you know, create projects, edit them, and delete them. And then for each project, we can create different tasks. And then also mark them as completed. Go ahead and delete some, edit some more. And of course, you can log out, and then you can log back in. So a very, very simple application. Uh, hopefully this is a good start just to kind of explain the concepts of Vue and Adonis. So let's just go ahead and get started building out this application. All right, so now that we know what we're trying to build, let's go ahead and create a new repository. So on my GitHub account, I'm going to click New. This is for people who don't know how to create a repo. So I'm going to name the repo Vue Adonis to do. Go ahead and make that MIT. And I'll create that repo. Once my repo is created, I'm just going to go ahead and cl click this clone or download and then copy this to my clipboard. Then in my terminal of VS Code, I'm going to go into my workspace. I'm going to do git clone and type in that repo URL. And go ahead and just CD into that folder. In fact, I should probably open the folder here in my workspace. So for this tutorial, I'm going to split it up into two major sections. The first section, I'm going to focus on building out the REST API using Adonis.js. And then the second section, I'm going to be connecting to that REST API using Vue.js for the front end. So if you're not really interested in learning how to use Adonis to build a REST API, feel free to skip forward to the second section, and I'll put a timestamp in the description below. So again, we're using Adonis.js to build out our REST API. And basically, that is a Laravel clone, an MVC framework for building up websites. I'm not going to go into too much detail on the docs or explain all the different features and functionality. Instead, what I want to do is just use it, explain the things that I'm doing as I'm doing them, and then leave it up to you to learn more about the framework in the future. So to start using Adonis, let's go ahead and go to their website and just look at the installation section. Basically, to get started, they say you need to install a global Adonis CLI tool, which I already have installed, so I'm not going to run this command. And then after you run the command, you can do Adonis help to get information about what you can run with the CLI. Let's go ahead and do that. So if I do Adonis hyphen hyphen help, it's going to print out all the different commands we can run in Adonis. Um, now, when you're starting off with a new project, the most important command would be, obviously, is the new command, right? So we're going to do Adonis new hyphen hyphen help to get more information on that command. And if you see here, we can pass something called API only. And that's kind of what we're going to be using for this, because we don't care about rendering views and stuff on the back end, since we're going to be using Vue.js on the front end. With that being said, let's just do Adonis new, type in the name of our project. And in this case, I'm just going to do server. I like to separate my server code from my client code. And then I'm going to pass that API only flag. And as this is running, it's going to create a bunch of different files in our server folder and give us a very bare bones Adonis setup, which we can start running and developing our REST API. So now that the Adonis CLI is done creating a new project, let's go ahead and look at an important command that we can use for starting or serving our server. So again, if we do Adonis hyphen hyphen help, it'll tell us all the commands. And then notice that there is a serve man which starts our HTTP server. So I'll do Adonis serve hyphen hyphen help. And we have additional options that we can use. And the most important one is hyphen hyphen dev to start a local dev server. So I'm gonna do Adonis serve hyphen hyphen dev. And of course, make sure you're in the server folder forgot to cd into that and I'll rerun that command. And after this runs, it's going to host a server on port 3333. So if I go to my terminal or go to my um, Chrome and go to localhost 3333, notice that we get a JSON response back from our Adonis server. So we're good to go. We have Adonis set up and we have it running. Another cool thing I'll 
state about this um, Adana serve command is that as you edit your JS files and save them, it's going to restart your server for you automatically. So it's kind of using like node mod behind the scenes where it just watches your files and restarts them. So before we get too much further into this tutorial, let's go ahead and commit what we have. I'm going to say initial Adonis setup. So at this point, let me just go ahead and give a quick overview on some of the files that are generated. I'm not going to go over all these files. I'm just going to focus on the ones we need to implement our functionality, and then we can kind of cover more as time progresses. So the first one we want to cover is inside the start folder, there is a file called routes.js. And basically this file is for declaring your routes. So, I mean, it looks very similar to express or COA or happy where you have a router object, you give it a command such as git, post, delete, patch, whatever. You pass it a URL and then you pass it a callback function. So nothing too new here. Second file or folder I want to show is inside the app folder. By default, we're giving a models folder, which has a user.js model. So if we look at this, basically we're declaring a lucid model, which has a hook attached to it. So before we create a user model, we're going to hash the password. And then at the end, we just return that model. So nothing too too insane here. And then inside the hooks folder, we have that user.js file, which declares that hash password hook. So in here, basically we say, if the user instance has a password attribute, we're just going to hash it and then put it back into the password before we save this model. And so for those of you who aren't really familiar with how like OR, ORMs work, typically there's a bunch of hooks that exist around models, like before you update them, before you create them, before you save them, that you can kind of attach callback functions to to manipulate your data before it actually hits your database. <clears throat> and the same with like getting data. You could do a hook before you fetch the data or after you fetch the data to manipulate the data inside your models. So I'm not gonna dive too much into hooks or that type of stuff. Feel free to look at the docs if you want more information. But the main takeaway is we have by default a user model. So You'll notice here there's no attributes so associated with this user model inside this file. And that's because if we go back and look at the database folder, there are a migrations folder, which has a user.js migration in it. So inside here, this is where we declare what properties should be associated with the users table. So basically when we run our migration scripts, it's going to create a users table. It's going to give it a username, email, and password. And then if we were to roll back our migration, it's just going to drop this table. All right, so another quick, quick recap. We have a routes file where you declare your routes. We have a models folder where you declare your models. And then you declare your tables that will be associated with that model in your migration scripts. All right, so now that we kind of glossed over some of the files and folders that are included in the Adonis CLI um, new projects, Let's go ahead and get started on trying to implement some functionality. So the first thing I want to do with our to-do list tutorial application is I want the ability for users to register new users or new accounts. So how would we do this? Obviously, the first thing we want to do is create a new endpoint or a new route where they can hit with a post request to create a new account. So if I go to the start folder and go back to my routes.js file, Inside here, we can simply do a route.post because we're doing a post request. And then we can do something like auth slash register and do some type of callback function. And inside here, I'm just going to re return another hello world message just to kind of demonstrate what's going on. So if I were to save this file, and then go to another app that I have installed and running called Postman, we can make example requests to our API just to test it out. So remember, our endpoint is auth slash register. It needs a post request. So if we go to Postman, which is here, this is on um, the Postman app. It's really useful for testing your REST APIs. We type in the location of that URL, so auth slash register. And I tell it to do a post request and I give it a body. In fact, I don't think I even need to give it a body. So I'll just go, go ahead and click send. Notice that it sends back our hello world message. So we created a register endpoint that returns a message. Awesome. First steps are completed. So for the second step, we instead want to 
put our callback logic in a controller and not have it all defined in one file of routes.js. So if we were to go to our second terminal, and remember that we have all these useful commands, which we can use to run and create our Adonis app. One of the commands is make controller. So if I do Adonis make controller help, get more information on that. Basically, we can run Adonis make controller, pass it the name of our controller, which in this case, I'm just going to say a user. And that will create a controller file inside the, again, make sure I'm in the server folder. Keep forgetting to do that. Well, first of all, that's going to ask if you want it to be a WebSocket channel or an HTTP request. I'm going to say HTTP request. And notice that that's going to create a app.controllers folder HTTP um, controllers file here. So let's go ahead and look at that file and see what it created. And basically, this is just a simple JavaScript class. Nothing too special here. But what we want to do is we want to define methods in this class. So in this case, we're going to say register. And just return that hello world message. And then to bind that to one of our routes, we simply go back to our routes file. And then instead of passing the callback function here, we can just say user controller dot register. So again, let me save that file and go back to my first terminal just to make sure that the server restarted. And then if I go back to Postman and click send, we get that same response back. Main difference is we're just binding to the controller file and then more specifically to the action or method that's declared inside that controller class. So before we get too ahead of ourselves, let's go ahead and do a little bit of cleanup. So first of all, I'm going to remove this get request method because we're not going to be using that. So another cool thing Adonis has is you have the ability to group routes with a prefix. So let's say I wanted to append slash API in front of all these different routes that I had. So if you imagine I had like 10 different routes and I wanted to append API to all of them, you could do it this way where you have a bunch of copy and paste like URLs with the same prefix. Or one way to do it is I just simply do route.group, asset a callback function, put my route in, and then after the group, you just say prefix with API. So now when I save that, if I try to hit the route that we had before, it's going to return an error, but now I can actually hit it with the API prefix. So that's pretty cool. And then, you know, sometimes you want to have different versions. So this might be version zero, and then down the road, a year from now, let's say you need a version one to get deployed. You just say change that to v1 and then you have all of your different routes for the v1 here but let's go ahead and try to get back on track so what were we originally doing we were trying to create a new register endpoint where we could pass in an email and a password in the payload and then have that created in our database so let me just go ahead and remove v0 because we're not going to be using that in this tutorial and then if i go to my user controller what we want to do is we want to be able to grab the request body that was sent in. So as an example, if I were to post some JSON to the endpoint, so if you see here we have an email and a password sent, we should be able to use that in our controller. So to do so, let's go ahead and first grab that request object, which is available using object deconstruction here. And then inside this, we can go ahead and pull out the email and the password again using object de deconstruction from request.all. So request.all is going to grab and merge our query string parameters together with our post payload body. And then we have the ability to grab the properties like so. And again, we're just gonna print these out and just make sure that everything is working as expected. So if I do that post request, and I go back to my terminal, I see that testing and the password is printed out to our terminal. So we grabbed the parameters or the payload body successfully using something like this. The next step to how would we register a user is we need to use the Lucid model to create and persist a new user to the database. So to get started on that, let's go ahead and include that user model. And then inside Adonis, there's a keyword called use. 
So instead of using require, they recommend you use the keyword use. And that's just because this um, the inverse of controller method that they're using allows you to easily mock out and fake these during your testing. Another cool thing is you can just do the uh, relative, you don't have to do like dot dot slashes, your relative paths to your file to get this to work. Instead, we can just do the absolute path, so app.models.user. So that's going to grab the app.models.user file here, which is a lucid model. And now that we have that model, we could simply just do user.create, pass it the email, pass it the password. And then of course, we also declared something else called a username, which we're going to be setting to the password in this case. And we need to just at the end return the user. So one thing I'll notice or I'll point out is that these are typically async methods. So dot create or save or whatnot. So in order to successfully use them, you need to make sure you put await in front. And of course, in order to use await, you need to make sure you use the keyword async in front of your method. So now if I save this, I should be able to create that user when I do my post request. I got a little error here, and the error is saying I don't have SQLite 3 installed. So let's go ahead and do that. If I go to my terminal and just install that, that will allow us to actually connect to our SQLite server because you need to make sure you install the specific driver of the database you're using. So if we're using MySQL or Postgres, you need to make sure you install the correct driver. And in this case, we're using SQLite. So we should be able to just install that and we should be good to go. But let's try it again and hopefully it works. So if I click send, we are getting yet another error. So let me see what's going on here. And one thing I do to kind of debug is I have JSPIN loaded up. I can just paste the HTML fine here. And this is saying that there's no such table as users. And the reason that this is throwing an error is because we forgot to run our migration scripts. So let's move on to yet another topic, which is migration. So if I open up a new terminal here and do Adonis help, we can see what command we have related to migrations. And if you see here, there's five commands for migrations. The, the one we're kind of um, curious to use would be migrations colon run. And that's going to run through your migration scripts and run anything that it hasn't already ran yet. So here I'm just going to do Adonis migration run, run that. And that's going to create our user table and our token table. So finally, if I were to do a post request on that endpoint, we should be able to persist that user. And look, it did. We got our email back. We got a password, which is hash back. We got our username created at updated at, and we got an ID. So just to verify that this is actually persisted to the database. If we try to do this again, notice we get an error back. If we look at this error, it's going to say that a constraint failed. There's no unique um, user email. So basically, this error is saying that we've already used the email and we can't use it again. So we know that it's trying to create that same user and put it into the database. It's throwing an exception and it's sending a 500 status code back with an error message. Awesome. So as a really, really quick recap, we created a new route which accepts a post request to auth slash register. We prefix it with API and we're binding that to the user controller register action or method. Then inside the user controller, we made an async function, which takes the requests. It takes the parameters or body from the request. We use object deconstruction to grab the email and password. We create a user using that email and password and set up a username. Important, make sure you use await here. Make sure you have a sync here. We get the user that was created and we return it back to the user. And then using Postman, we saw that when we tried to create a user. So if I do testing two or three, it should create a new user with testing three and send it back to us. Cool. So now that we know how to create new routes and controllers and stuff, let's go ahead and try to create a new one called login. And what login is going to do, it's going to check to see if the email and password we provide matches what is actually in the database. So to do so, again, we just need to make a new method here inside this controller called async login. And that's going to take the request object for now. 
And again, we need to grab the email and password from that request. So I'll just do that. And then secondly, there's something cool that's already built into Adonis, which is an auth property that's passed in here. And basically what auth does is it has a couple of helper function functions on it that allows you to try to authenticate your user. So if I were to do comma auth, we now have access to that auth controller. And the main reason we have access to that is if we look at our app.js file here inside the start folder, there's a provider which was declared called the auth provider, which gives us access to that auth thing or auth um, object. So if this wasn't here, we wouldn't be able to do that. And then what type of authentication are we actually using? So if we were to dive into the config folder here and look at auth.js, notice that there's a couple of different auth types that are kind of built in. We have session, we have basic auth, we have JWT. So by default, this is using the JWT auth. And if we look down at the JWT configuration, notice that it's pointing to our user model. It's going to automatically try to fetch based on email and password. So these are the two columns that it's going to look at. And it's going to use the secret key here to define a new JWT um, token. So if you don't really know that much about JWT, I suggest you go read up on it. I'm not going to really give you that much of a deep dive on it. But just know that this authentic authentication um, object that we're using is just going to look at our database and it's going to create a key for us if the user is successfully logged in. So doing so, let's go back to our controller. Remember we brought in this auth um, object. What we want to do is we want to try to authenticate the user. So we're going to say const token is equal to await auth dot attempt. And then we're going to pass it our email and we're going to pass it our password. And then we're going to return that token. So if this is successful, we're going to get a token, send it back to the user. If this fails, it's probably going to throw an exception and send back an error to the user. So if I save this file, this last part is we need to go to our routes file and we need to declare a new endpoint so that we can actually try to register or log in. So I'm going to copy and paste this line 19 and instead of register, I'm going to do login and then login for action here. Save the file. And now at this point, I should be able to try to log in with that same username and password that we just registered with. So if you remember, we registered with testing at gmail.com and that's the password. So if I just copy this payload and instead go to my auth slash login endpoint and click send, we get back a response that has a token in it. So for those who don't know what a JWT token is basically it's just a way to cryptographically sign a JSON object. So if I were to take this token and if I go to JWT.io, I can paste my token into their website and it's going to decode it for me. So if you notice here, after I pasted it in, this is the data that's encoded inside of that payload. Basically it just has a user ID. So if you notice here, it's a one. Just to kind of further demonstrate that, remember we made another account called testing three. If I try to log in with that, it's gonna give us a different token. And if I want to decode that token inside this website, notice that the user ID here is a two. So behind the scenes, Adonis, the auth module, is just going to fetch the user from the database, verify that the username and password match up correctly, and then if it does, it's going to just encode a token that has a user ID in it. So the cool thing about this is I can come into this token and just make random changes to it. But if I do, it's going to fail the signature that only the server knows about. So with that being said, basically, any token that the server signs and sends to the user we know with certainty that no one else can modify that token and send back to us. And we can kind of cover an example in a little bit because we're not fully done implementing authentication yet. So I'll keep this website up and let's go back to our code and just kind of look at one more thing that we can refactor. 
So another thing I wanted to do is when you register your user, you're probably going to need that same token, right? So what I like to do is instead of just returning the user we created, I'm just going to return this dot login and then pass the arguments that were passed into this request. And in this case, we don't really need the user anymore. So now that when we register or if we log in, we pretty much get this payload back every time. So if I go back to register and I make a new account testing 100, we get back our payload that has the token in it. Awesome. So we just made a new login method. We modified the register method to call a login after we register. And then we created the route to allow us to register and log in. So we're making some good progress. Now we just need to um, move on to creating some new database models. And before we move on to that, let's just go ahead and commit what we have. So I'm going to say registration slash login and commit that. And then we can start fresh and I've dive back into those files as we need. So since we are planning to make a to-do list application, one thing I want to include is a new project model. So I plan to separate my data into projects and then inside the projects we have tasks. So Let's look back at the Adonis CLI and see what commands we can use to try to help us create a new model. So I do Adonis help. Notice here we have a make model. So Adonis make model help. And basically we just pass the name of the model. And then there's also like a controller and migration if you want to create a migration for the model. And in this case, we do also want a migration, so be sure to include this hyphen M. So again, we wanted a project model. So if I say project and then pass hyphen M, that's going to create us a project model inside our models folder. Fresh my VS code. And then also we get a migration script called projects. So first off, let's go to our projects migration and we need to make sure we declare um, some attributes on our projects before we run our migration scripts. So to do so, I'm going to look at the users and just kind of copy this one line here. And we want our projects folder to have a title. That's going to be a 255 max length string. And I'm just going to remove the rest because I don't care if it's unique and I don't care if it's null or not. Second thing I want to do is a project belongs to a user, right? So inside our migration script, if I look at token, they have an example of how to do that. Basically, if I copy this line and go back to my project schema, put that up here, we want to affiliate the project to a user. So we need to make sure a user ID column exists on the project's table. So we're saying, yes, it's an integer of user ID. It's unsigned, it references the ID in the users table. And then the last part is we need to go into our projects model and we need to make sure we declare an association. So if we look at the token.js file here, or I'm sorry, the uh, user JS file, what we can do to declare associations is simply just copy and paste this project or this tokens um, method. And instead, we're going to name it projects. And this is going to say this dot has many app dot model dot project. And this just tells Lucid how to look up particular associated records using the projects method. So literally inside of our controller, we can do user dot projects and that's going to fetch us all the projects associated with that user. And then the second thing we want to do is we want to go back into our project model and create a new method called user to declare that association in the other way. So I'm going to say return this dot belongs to app models user. And this is just saying that a project belongs to a user and then a user has many projects. So uh, that allows us again to easily look up data both ways, depending on what type of Lucid model we have instantiated in our code.
And this will make more sense when we actually start using it. So again, we created a new model called project, which created us a migrations file. We declared a title inside that migrations projects table. And we also declared a user ID, which references the users table. And then we declared some associations in our project and user model. So what we want to do is we need to run our migration again. So if I do migration run, that's going to only run that project migration script because we've already ran those past two, right? So now in our database, we should have a table called projects and that should be ready to go. Awesome. So the second thing is we need to create a new controller in route so that we can actually create new projects, right? So if I just close all of these and then we can start doing that. Remember in Adonis, we have a create or a make controller method. So here, if I do make controller, so Adonis make controller help to get more information. I'm going to pass it the project as a name. So that we have a new controller called project. And that's going to be an HTTP type of controller. And inside of a project controller, let's just go ahead and do a index method. <clears throat> and what this method is supposed to do is supposed to return all the projects that are associated with the user. And of course, we don't have a create method yet, so we'll have to make one in a second. So in order to do so, we're going to need that auth plugin again. And luckily, auth has a nice little utility function called get user. So if I do const user equals await auth.getUser, that's going to fetch us the user which was associated with the JWT token that we passed in. So again, if I just print out user here and then return um, some random message for now, we should be able to create a route, which is going to point to that controller. So here I can say route.get, and that's going to be on projects, and that's going to be on project Controller.index. Wrap that in a string. So I'll go ahead and save my server, and I should be able to try to hit that project's endpoint. Hmm. And in this case, I'm going to pretend like we didn't pass an authentication token. And this should throw an error because we haven't actually passed a JWT token like we said we needed to. So if you see here, unexpected token const user await auth.getUser. And we're actually getting this because I probably forgot to add async. So remember, make sure you always add async if you're using await here. And then I'll try to hit that endpoint again. See what the error is. And we get an invalid JWT token, right? JWT must be provided. So at this point, what we want to do is when we declare the route, we also want to declare a middleware function so that we can parse the JWT token from the request. So inside of our line 22, where we declare our index, we want to make sure that we add a middleware call and tell it that it's going to be an auth call. So basically, we're going to authenticate the user with that JWT token before we run our controller here. So again, if I try to hit that endpoint, we're going to get back an error again saying JWT must be provided. So let's go ahead and try to provide that JWT token. So if I go back to login and I just log in with our testing at gmail.com user and I grab this token, typically the way to pass a JWT token is inside the header, you have an authorization key and then you pass it something called bearer and then the token like so. And then inside Postman, what we have is we have environments where we can just set up kind of key value pairs so we can use those in all of our requests. So if I look at the environment here, I already have one set up called authorization, which is set to a token. So let's change it to the token I just copied and put bearer in front. And this is just the nomenclature we use because it's a bearer type token. Go ahead and update that, close out of that, and then I'm gonna make my request and see what happens.
So at this point, we get a message back that says, hello world. And then if we were to leave off this authentication token, we're going to get back that same error saying that JWT token was not provided. This is also going to check your token to make sure it is valid. So if I were to go and try to create and spoof my own token and send it to this endpoint, it's not going to work as expected. So going back to our code, the main thing that we wanted to kind of show is that once we fetch auth.get user, it prints out that user information here. So we have access to user.id inside of this controller if we wanted to use it. So go ahead and just print that out. Hit that endpoint one more time. And notice here it's printing out one, because if you remember in JWT IO, when I decode this token, it's printing out user ID of one. And what that does is going to fetch the user from the database using UID. And then we have access to that user model here. Okay, so we're almost done with this project index method. The next thing we need to do is using that user, we need to fetch and return all of the projects that are associated with that user. So if I do return await user.projects, Dot fetch. That's going to use our associations to fetch all the projects that are associated with that user. So if I save this, go back and request that endpoint, it should return back an empty array because we don't have any projects created yet. Which leaves us to our next route. Let's go ahead and create a create endpoint. So if I do async create, I'm going to take an auth and a request. And let's kind of step through what we might want to do, right? So we first need to verify that the user has the token passed in. So if I go to routes, I'm just going to create a new um, post request to slash projects. It's going to call our create action. And then again, make sure that we're authenticated. And then we want to grab that user. So const user is equal to await auth.get user from the database. So we have a lucid model instance we can use. We want to grab the title that was passed in in the payload. So for example, if we were to go back and post a project, we're going to pass the title YOLO here. And we're going to fetch it from the request here. Now we want to create a new project, but we haven't included project yet. So first we need to say, bring in const project from app.models.project. And then we need to create a project. So project is equal to new project. This is going to create us a new instance of our lucid model for the project. We want to fill in or set values. So one thing I could do is I could do project.title is equal to title. Or something you can also do is project.fill and then pass it an object. And that's going to set anything that you pass in. So if I were to say um, name and name exact, and if name actually existed on the database, it's going to put name onto that project too, but it doesn't. So let's just get rid of that. And then finally, we want to create the project and associate it with the user, right? So if we do await user.projects, Dot save and pass the project. And then finally, we can return that project. So recap, we created a route for that project's create method. We make sure it's authenticated. We grab the user. We fetch the title from the request. We create a project and fill in that title information. We associate the project with that user, and then we return the project back. So let's go ahead and try to hit this endpoint now. So I'm going to click send. It works successfully and it returned us the project that it created. So it has an ID of one, has a user ID of one, has the title YOLO. And now just to demonstrate, if I go back to my projects endpoint and try to fetch all the projects for my user, it's going to return an array with that project created. And so I can hit this a couple of times to keep creating projects. And then when I try to fetch all the projects for my user, Notice that we have like five or four projects returned. Well, let's just go ahead and commit what we have, and then we can kind of just 
knock out all the remaining project methods. Okay, so the last two methods we're going to create on the projects controller is going to be a create, or I'm sorry, not create, it's going to be a delete and an update method. So let's go back to our routes and let's go ahead and make a new endpoint that takes a delete request. And this one is going to actually take a ID. So if I do project ID here, in fact, I'll just keep it ID to keep it generic. And then we can call a destroy method. And again, make sure the user is authenticated before we hit this endpoint. So if we go back to our project controller and then create a async method called destroy, that's going to take an auth and a request. So let's kind of step through what we need to do. Again, we need to fetch the user. So whatever user made the request, get that user model. And then we need to get the project ID that we declared here in the route. So to do that in Adonis, we could also include another property called param, or sorry, params. And that's going to give us the query parameters and we need the ID. So if I do ID is equal to params.id, or again, if we wanted to do object deconstruction, we could do this. After we have the ID, we want to fetch the project that's associated with the ID. So if we do const project equals to await project.find. Now find is a method that you can use. It pass in the ID that we want to find. And it's going to return the project model. So I'm just going to say find ID. That's going to return us the project. Um, now at this point, we don't want any user to just potentially destroy this model, right? We want to make sure that the project we fetched actually has access or the user that did call destroy actually has access to the project, right? So what we can do is we can just say, make sure that project dot user ID is equal to user dot ID before we do anything. In this case, I'm just going to say not equal. And then if they're not equal, I'm going to return something to the user. So here, I'm going to say response dot or return response dot status of 403. So basically return a 403 status code, which is authentication or authorization error status. If the project that we fetched does not match the user that was passed in with the GWT token. But if we do have access, we're going to not hit that if statement. And underneath here, we can just say project.delete. And then we're going to return the project that was deleted. So let's just go ahead and save this and try to test it out. So going back here, notice that this user has a bunch of different projects associated with it. So let me just grab project three, and I'm going to go to the delete request and tell it to delete project three. So after I run that, it's returning the project information that was deleted. And if I go back to my get request, try to fetch all the projects. Notice that three does not exist in this list anymore. So our delete method is working as expected. Um, before we move on, something like this is going to be copied and pasted a lot throughout our application. So I kind of want to abstract that into a different helper service or something like that. So what we can do is I'm going to make a new folder inside an app called services. And I'm sure there's other ways to do this. I'm not 100% sure. I'm sure you could use like providers as well. But for now, I'm going to keep it simple. And I'm just going to make a new service called authorization service. And inside that service, I'm just going to make a class called authorization, like a type. And that's going to have a method called verify permission which takes a resource and it takes a user. And basically it's going to do the exact same thing as we did before. I say if the resource dot user ID is not equal to the user dot ID, we're going to throw some new error. And in a second, I'm going to actually use a real error here. Now what we can do is back in our project controller, we can go to the top and include that. So I'm going to say authorization service is equal to use app services 
authorization service. And instead of doing this if statement here, I'm just going to say authorization service that verify permission project user. Okay. So hopefully if everything works out correctly, if I were to run this with the delete method and pass it ID four, it should still delete that resource. Um, and in this case, I got an exception. Let's see. Let's see what that exception was. Verify permission is not a function. So I might have spelled something wrong. Verify permission. Authorization service. Oh, I forgot to export at the bottom. My bad. So make sure at the bottom, I'm just going to export a new authorization service here that we can use it. So if now if I were to hit this endpoint, it, delete, it deleted this um, project with an ID of four. So everything is still working as expected. Um, but if I want to test if I had access to the resource, so let me just log in with a different user. So if you remember, we made user of testing three. Let me grab that token and update here. Difficulties deleting this token, huh? Okay, so we updated the environment to have a different token for testing three. Now I want to delete ID of one and two, which if you notice has a user ID of one, but the token that I'm set up with is not that correct user. So if I go back to delete and try to delete project one, we get back an exception. And in this case, it should be a very generic exception. It doesn't say anything, but notice that this is actually running now. So if I were to go here and just print something else and try to delete that again, notice that it prints out invalid access. So something cool in Adonis that I need to point out is that when an exception is thrown in your controller, it's going to return that exception to the user. So I don't need to have if statements and like specify certain status codes and return. Instead, I could abstract that into an exception. So again, going back to our really useful Adonis CLI, if I do Adonis help, notice that we can make an exception here. So I'm going to do Adonis make exception help to get information on that. And this one only takes the name. So I'm going to say, let's see, authorization. Uh, actually, I'm going to name it invalid access, invalid access. And that should make a new exception called invalid access exception inside this exceptions folder. So now that we have the invalid access exception, we could just write a custom handler function, which is going to take in an error as the first argument. And then you can have access to the response here. And basically we just want to return a response of a 403 status code to the user, the so return response status of 403. And then I'm going to send it back some JSON that says error invalid access to resource. So now that I save that, so invalid access exception is equal to use app.exceptions.invalidaccess exception. Instead of throwing new error, we can just throw our new exception here. Our access the authorization server should be returning that exception. And then when this exception fires from Adonis, it's going to return a 403 status. So if I go back and hit that endpoint, Notice we get a 403 forbid, forbidden and we get invalid access to resource. And this kind of helps us clean up our controllers so that we don't have a bunch of if statements to check if something is defined or if a user exists. Um, so another exception I want to catch is for whatever reason, if let's say project was not defined, so they give us ID of a thousand, this is going to be null here, which is going to hit this function and probably throw um, a 500 error, right? So let's just go ahead and make another exception called resource not exist. And inside verify permission, if we were to just check and say if resource was not defined, 
Let's just throw a new invalid, or sorry, resource not exist exception. And there might be a better way to do this that's already like built into the uh, Adonis framework, but this seems to work for now. And then of course, inside of that exception, we just copy the handler that we had in our previous exception, paste it here, and we want this to be a 4-4 and say, the resource did not exist. Cool, so I'll save that one. I'll go back and I'll try like code of a thousand, click send, and notice that we get back a 404 not found, the resource did not exist. So that is a really high level overview of exceptions and how you can handle them to return custom status codes to your requests. Let's go ahead and commit what we have now and move on to the last one, which is gonna be update. So I'm gonna call this one destroy with exceptions. Go back to my code and let's get back to a nice state just to continue working. Okay, so the last route that we want to add for projects would be an update route. So here if I say route.patch, and again that's going to be project slash ID, and then we're going to say update. That's going to also need the auth middleware. So we created our route, let's go to our controller and create our action. So I'm going to say update auth request params. Very similar code. We could probably pull this out into like helper functions so we don't copy and paste code everywhere. But since this is just a simple tutorial, probably not gonna do that. So again, I'm fetching the user from the auth helper function. I'm fetching the ID that we wanna update. I'm fetching the project that we want to update. I'm gonna verify that we have access to that project and that the project also exists. And then finally, what we want to do is we want to fill in like we did before. In this case, I'm going to do merge. So project.merge. Then I'm going to say merge it with the request of the title. So only grab the title that's passed into the request. And then I want to save that. So project.save. And then I want to return the project. So this is kind of a new method that we, we saw. Basically, it's going to take from the body of the request, just grab me the title. So if someone were to pass in a bunch of different properties, I just want the title here. And then I want to merge that into the project and save it and return. So at this point, let's just go back and fetch all the projects that do exist on this user. Because remember, we deleted a bunch. Uh, we don't have any, so let me just create a new one. Go back and fetch it. Cool, so we have a project with ID5, which belongs to user2. Let's change the title to GG. So if I go to my patch endpoint, I'm making a patch request to project slash five. We want to change the title to GG. So if I were to send this now, this should work. Okay, and it did. So we've updated the title to be GG. And if I go back and try to fetch the projects associated with my user, the title is now GG. Okay, so update is working as expected now. So we have our four main CRUD methods. We have create, fetch, update, and destroy. Um, we don't necessarily need show at this point because I don't think we need to fetch a single project in the UI, but we could always come back and add that if we need to. So let's go ahead and commit that. So let's say add update, endpoint, and then we can move on to our tasks. Okay, so for our tasks, we're gonna, be, we're gonna need to create a new model so again, we can go here and say make model, and then we're gonna pass it task with hyphen M so it creates our migration scripts. And let's move to our migration scripts and just add whatever we need for the, uh, the task entry. So task is gonna have a title and it's also gonna be associated with a project. So I'm just gonna copy those and instead of user ID, I'm going to say project ID. And that's going to be in the table projects, refers to ID. This looks good. And then instead of title, I'm just going to say description. So tasks should be set up correctly. And now I need to go into my models. 
And very similar to how we did before, I'm going to go to our user model. And I'm going to copy and paste this. Because a task has many, or sorry, a project has many tasks. So here I'm going to go tasks, and then a project has many tasks. Then inside of our task, I'm going to say a task has one or belongs to a project. Go ahead and save that. I should be able to run my migration scripts at this point, which will create our tasks table, and we should be able to actually use our Lucid models to start manipulating with that table. Okay, so let me go ahead and just close out of some of these so it's not so overwhelming. Take a step back, what are we doing? So, we want the ability for users to create new tasks. And because of the way a task is set up, you can't really have a task unless you have a project in which it associates with. So I'm just going to add a new endpoint here called projects of slash ID slash tasks. So a user can post a task to a project. And of course, here we're going to say task controller instead of project controller. And that's going to be a create method. And of course, we need to make sure we're authenticated here as well. So now that we have that route set up, let's go to our task controller, which we don't have created yet. So if I go make controller and then pass that task, that'll create us a new controller file for our HTTP requests. And inside here, we need an async create method. And this one's going to be very similar to the project create method. So let's probably just go ahead and create or copy and paste all the code that was under our project create method. So if I go to project, I go to create, I'm going to copy this code. And then, of course, make sure you include the things up here that you need. So we're going to need project and we're probably going to need task. So I'm going to include project and task. Okay, so when we create a task, remember that in the params we have that project ID. So, you know, I'll comment this out for now so we can just kind of reference it. But first of all, yes, we're going to need the user. So let's just grab that user. Oh, I don't know why that happened. Auto complete. And then we need to grab the description from the request. So I'll do description of request of all. And then we need the project ID. So ID from params. Remember we don't have auth here, so let's bring in auth, let's bring in request, and let's bring in params. We're gonna need to fetch the project. So const project is equal to await project dot find by id so that'll fetch us the project we want to verify that the user has access to the project so i'm just going to go here and copy and paste this authorization service stuff so then we verify that the project the user has access to the project So if you remember before when we created a project and we associate it with a user, it's kind of the same deal here. So what we need to do is we need to say create a task. I'm going to say const task is equal to new task. To instantiate a new lucid instance model. And then I'm going to say task.fill. I'm going to pass it description. And then I need to associate that task with a project. So I'm going to say wait project dot tasks dot save I'm going to pass it the task and I want to return that task back to the user so nothing nothing new here at all it's just kind of a matter of doing a little bit more extra code because we need to grab the project and then we need to associate the task with the project and then all, all the other stuff we've seen before fetching the user fetching the description from the parameters or the ID from the parameters the description from the request that's all said and done in the past So while we're here, let's just go ahead and create an index method so we can fetch all the tasks associated with the project so we can easily test and see what's going on. So I'm going to add a, another route called 
it on the tasks endpoint. And that's going to call the index method. And that again is going to be indicated here. So going back here, I'm going to say make a new method called async of index. That's going to take auth and request. And very similar, we need the user. We're going to need params as well, actually. So in fact, let me just copy all this and then delete what we don't need. So we fetch the user. We don't need the description because we're not really creating or updating anything. So remove that. We don't need to make a new task, so remove that. We don't need to fetch or associate tasks, so remove that. Cool. So we get the user, get the project ID, we fetch the project, we verify user has access to the project. Then we just need to return await project.tasks.fetch. And that should return all the tasks that are associated with a particular project ID, assuming that the user has access to that project ID. So let's try to test out these two methods and hopefully everything works out. So again, let's create a new project just so that we have something to work with. And then that project ID is a six. So if I go to tasks here, we want to be able to post a new task to that project ID. So I'm going to put project ID a six here. I'm going to pass a description of hello, make sure my headers are set up and they are. So hopefully if I click send, this will get added to the database and it did. So now project ID of six has a hello task. And if I do it again, I should have two tasks. So then to fetch the tasks, I'm going to click on the get request URL that I have saved here. I'm going to change this to get the project ID of six tasks. Make sure the header's set up and it is. So when I click send here, I should get two tasks back and we do. So awesome. Those two endpoints we just created are now working and really that didn't take much time at all to create. Um, so we're kind of coming close to wrapping this up. So let me just go ahead and commit what we have. So I'll say tasks, index and create. And let's move on to the last two things that we need for a task. Obviously, we need to be able to update and delete tasks, right? So let's go back to here. Let's make a route.delete on tasks of ID. So make that a destroy call and make sure you have middleware. And let's just go ahead and make the other one while we're at it here. So we need a patch request and we need to be able to update the task. So for deleting a task, it's going to be very similar to deleting a project. So I'm just going to go to the destroy method, copy and paste that into my task controller and kind of modify it as needed. So here again, we fetch the user. We need the task ID or we need the project ID. I mean, actually, no, we don't, we don't need the project ID. So this is going to be the task ID here. We need to fetch the task. We need to verify at some point that the project that the task is associated with the user has access to. So here we need to say um, project our const project is equal to task.project.fetch. And then we can check that the project the task is associated with the user has access to. If they do, all we need to do is say await task.delete. And then we can just return that task here. So everything here should be OK. Let's go ahead and implement the last method, which is update. So just copy and paste some code. We're going to need probably similar code here. So again, we fetch the user, get the project ID here. Or sorry, get the task ID. Um, fetch the project. Let's associate with the task, verify the user's access to the project. And then instead of deleting here, we need to do that whole task dot merge. And then we're going to say request only. And we only care about the description in this case. And in fact, I forgot to have a completed. 
So when you're in the UI and you're clicking and marking tasks as completed, we want to have yet another Boolean called completed on that task object. So we're going to need to go back to our migration scripts and kind of update that. Um, but so let's finish up this task controller really quick. And then let's go back to our migration scripts. So we go to migrations, I go to task. And here I could just say Boolean of completed. So a cool thing you can do in Adonis is if we look at the migrations again, there should be a refresh. So if I do Adonis migration colon refresh, that's going to drop and reset all of my migrations and it's going to rerun them all again. So that basically we're creating this um, completed thing. Or we're adding this completed column to our table. You can also do rollbacks if you wanted to or reset or stuff. But refresh is pretty good because it just roll back, rolls back everything and then reruns them. So now our table should have a tasks. Or sorry, now our database should have a tasks table with a completed Boolean column in addition to the other ones I had before. So at this point, since we rolled back, it probably deleted all of her data. So we need to go back and register a user. And then we need to fetch this token and update our authorization header here. And then we need to create a project. Make sure we get that project ID of one. Let's go ahead and create a task on project one. Fetch the projects in the tasks just to make sure that everything is set up as it should be. Okay, so completed null, awesome. Description of hello. So we want to test out that we can, first of all, update that task. So this is task of ID one. Let's just check that we can update the description to patched and completed to false. So if I send that, we're getting back an error. So let's go ahead and look at the error here. Cannot find module controllers tasks controller. I think that's just because it's not task controller. It should be task. I named that incorrectly. So that's my bad. Let me save that. Go back and hit this endpoint. And now we're getting an invalid access to resource. 403 forbidden. Let's see. Okay, so looking back at the task controller, let's look at the update method and figure out why this is saying invalid access. So we're fetching the user, getting the ID, getting the task, getting the project. Verifying the user has access to the project. So what we could do here, just start printing stuff out. So project dot to JSON. I could do task dot to JSON and I could also do user dot to JSON and make sure all these kind of line up as we'd expect them to. Um, let's paste this and see what's going on. Project.toJSON is not a function. Okay. okay. So instead of saying to JSON, let's just print these out. So we have a task which has an ID of one, project ID of one. We have a user which has an ID of one. And we have a uh, where did project go? Oh. So this will get you every time. Make sure you always have a wait in front of your async calls. If you don't, this is just going to be a promise and then it never, not, nothing's really going to work as intended. But let me save that one and make sure I have that updated correctly as well. Okay. So sorry about that one. Let's see if this will finally work. Cool, so I think it finally patched that task with 
description patched completed false. So if I were to go back and try to get that task, see that we have completed is zero and patched is um, the description now. And then finally, we want to test if we can delete a task. So if we go to the delete method and tell it to delete task of ID one, click send, notice that it returns the task back to us. And if we try to fetch it again, it's not there. So a little bit of hiccups along the way, um, you know, stuff I forgot to do in this tutorial, but overall, I think we're done building out our REST API. It didn't take too much time because once you get a couple of routes going, it's as simple as copy, pasting, changing around. And then as time goes on, you'll notice that these CRUD methods are basically the same for every single resource. So you could probably create a helper method that decorates these controllers that kind of does this logic for you. But for the sake of the tutorial, let's not dive into refactoring or do anything like that. Basically, we have a way for users to register, log in, create projects, create tasks, update those tasks and projects, and delete them and stuff. So we're at a good state now that we can commit what we have, wrap this up, and move on to the Vue.js tutorial. All right, so now we're going to get started in the second section of this tutorial, which is the Vue.js front end. And very similar to the last section, I'm kind of just going to Create it as I go and explain what I'm doing. So if you feel lost at any time, feel free to pause and go look up the view documentation. So to get started with building out the UI, you move over to the Vue CLI GitHub repo. The latest version they have out is Vue version 3 beta.10. I'm going to install version beta 9 because I'm getting issues with 10. Um, but you don't want to use version 3 if you want to use the old Vue CLI 2. Um, I'm not sure how, how well that will translate to this tutorial. So in this tutorial, I'm using version 3. So if I copy that and go ahead and just paste it in my terminal and then put add version 3.0.0 beta.9, that's going to install the correct Vue CLI that I need to kind of demo. Awesome. So now that that is completed, we can simply run Vue, create, and then type the name of the folder or project you want to create. So in this, in this case, we're going to do client. We want to create a client folder that has our stuff. And after you do that, it's going to kind of walk you through a couple of questions as to what you want to use to set up your project. Um, so I'm going to do manual select features just to make sure that we're not installing something that we don't want. So I want the router, I want Vuex, and I'm just using the arrow on my keyboard and the space button to select stuff. Um, linter would be nice, and CSS preprocessors, I guess, would be nice. So I'll hit enter. Um, I'm going to say use SAS, and I'm going to use the Airbnb config. This is like the linter options. And I'll say, Slint on save should be good enough. And I'll have that in a dedicated config file. That should be okay. So after you select all the stuff that you want, it's going to go ahead and just create your client folder and initialize all your different view stuff. That might take a while because it's probably installing a lot of different packages. So now that that is finally done running, we have a view app over here, which I'll I'm not going to go through all these files. Um, we're just going to start developing on it, and I'll explain what I'm doing as we go through. But before we get started, there's a couple of extra dependencies I want to install now so that we don't have to worry about installing them later. So if we look at what we currently have, we really only have three dependencies, view, view router, and view X. But there's a couple more that we're going to need. So I'm going to do yarn, add. And then the first one we're going to need is Axios. And that's for doing uh, HTTP requests and whatnot. I like having Lodash just in case. Um, we're going to need Vuetify. And that is a material-like framework or library to kind of style your components and build up your app. And then two other helpful libraries I use is Vuex Persisted State. And that's so I can store my Vuex state into local storage and load it back when the Chrome tab opens up. And then finally, Vuex router sync. Oh, that's gonna go ahead and install all those dependencies. 
and update my package JSON with those. Now that that's all done, in fact, I ran it in the wrong directory, so let me just delete these. Wah, wah. Go into the client directory and rerun that. So to start off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the source folder. And inside here, we have a main.js, which is kind of where everything gets initialized and created for view. It's also where you need to like include a lot of your dependencies and set them up. So I'm going to do that with those dependencies we just yarn installed. So starting off, I'm going to include import sync from Vuex router sync. I'm going to import Vuetify from Vuetify. Um, let's see what else we might need. I think that's kind of all we need for right now. So what we can do is just include both of those or run them. So I'm going to say sync the store with the router. And then I want to tell view to use Vuetify. And I think that should be a good start. And of course, my linter is complaining that these should come at the very top because they are actually packages and not from my local files like these are. Yeah, so I'll do npm run serve. And that's going to open up a browser and point it to your view web page in just a second. So here we go. We have our view UI loaded and running. And if we did everything right, we should have those additional plugins like Beautify in the Vuex router sync set up. And just to verify that, I'm going to go to my view plugin here. So that's a, this is a Chrome plugin that you can install for using Vuex and debugging it. So as I change routes, we should see our route change in our state. If you see here, we have um, our route state here is at slash about, and before it was at slash. So that basically means that this sync command is working fine. And a little bit more refactoring, I like to put my store in a store folder. So I'm going to say store, I'm going to copy that into there. I'm going to rename this to index. Of course, if you do that, make sure you include it here. So instead of, actually, that should work as is. So a little bit more setup. I'm going to look at the store. I'm going to include that persist state package that we brought in. I'm going to say import create persisted state from Vuex persisted state. And then I want to make sure that we use it. So to use that, basically, you just need to declare a plugins array for your store. So down here, I can say plugins, an attribute which has a create persisted state object inside that array. And save that. <clears throat> Let's see, we're getting a error here. Something is still trying to load store.js, and that's probably in my main. It's coming from there. Okay. Well, for whatever reason, I need to do slash index here. Typically, the import is smart enough to just find the index file. I'm not sure why I need to do that. But hey, we're going to run into issues as we're making this UI. So the more issues that I debug, the probably the better it is for a tutorial. So let's go ahead and actually get started on building out some functionality. We did some initial setup. Some of it might have not made too much sense. It's kind of boilerplate setup. So really don't have to worry about it too much unless you're planning to do the exact same thing that I'm doing with this tutorial. So starting off, let's go ahead and try to start using Vuetify to build out some header or something like that at the top. So it's kind of nice to have a, a top header up here where we have things we can click. So the first thing I'm going to do is just load up the Vuetify docs. So Vuetify, go to their docs here. We're going to be using this throughout our tutorial to kind of figure out what components we can use to build up our application. 
So first off, they say in order to set up your app with Beautify, you need to make sure that you have everything wrapped in a V app component. An example down here looks like this. So if I just go back to my app.view, which is like the main part of this, what I need to do is just inside my template, I can say V app. And then of course, wrap everything in that. At that point, we should be okay. And then we're probably gonna refactor all this um, second. So since we did the setup, let's just go ahead and come out what we have. So not all, so all these files aren't just like green and kind of confusing. So I'll say initial view setup, go ahead and commit that. <clears throat> go back to my tree view. So let's get back on track, kind of jumping around. What we need to do here is we need to build out a Vuetify top navigation so that we can use it in our application. So if we go back to the docs, let's look at the components that they have. And they should have something called a toolbar. So if we click toolbars, it'll give us some examples of the toolbars that they have, and how to use them. So I'll click the code to get an example. And basically I'm just going to copy and paste this into my app for now. And then for all this stuff, we can just kind of leave it for now, but we're probably going to get rid of it. So if I save this file and go back to my view app, notice that the styles are all messed up. And that's mainly because I forgot to do an additional step in our setup, which was I need to include the Vuetify CSS. So if I go back to that main.js file, we need to make sure that we import the Vuetify projects CSS. So I'm going to do import Vuetify dist Beautify.min.css. Go ahead and save this. And we're going to run into an error because we haven't included. Actually, this is just a, a, <clears throat> a linting error. So let me go figure out how to fix this. This is trailing spaces are not allowed. We must have a trailing space somewhere, which is right here. So I'm going to go ahead and just remove that and save it. So that loaded correctly. If I go back to my app, awesome. We have the beautify CSS in the top now, except for now the menu is messed up. If you looked at the example, their toolbar has a little hamburger thing that you can click. Ours just says menu. So another thing that we forgot to set up, and it'd be nice if like there's already a project that kind of set all this stuff up for you, but I guess there's not. So do it by hand. So what we need to do at this point is we need to go into the public file, and I'm sure you can also import this in main, but the way I did it is I went to the public index.html file. And in this file, it's just a typical file that you know your app is going to be injected into. But we want to include the material icons. So if I go up here and just go ahead and just include that link to the material icon style sheet. So this is the material icon that we need to include. Just go ahead and save this. That hamburger menu should appear now and it does cool 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 okay so making some slow and steady progress let's go ahead and try to modify this to customize it to be kind of something we want so first of all I don't want the hamburger menu for now and these links over here need to be something that's actually related to what we're building and since we're building a to-do list application really all we need is like a register a logout button and maybe a button to see all your projects or something. Mm. And then maybe also like a link to see this YouTube video once I host it. So let's go back here and let's go to our app.view. Close all these. And then in here, for our title, I'm gonna say view to do. Go ahead and save that and just see that reflected here. Awesome. I kind of want to add some color to this. So I'm just going to say um, color is equal to green. And I want to make it a dark attribute so that the text is white. And then I want to say fixed so that it always stays on the top of my browser. So you notice here as I scroll down, it's still fixed to the top. So awesome. We have a view, a view to do toolbar green fixed. Go ahead and get rid of that 
hamburger um, icon. I really want that. So that's gone. Another thing we're going to add in is we need to add a button so we can click our projects. So V toolbar items. That's going to be a class of hidden for small. Actually, I'm not going to add any class to that. So pretty much you wrap your buttons and stuff in a V toolbar, toolbar items and inside here you add your buttons. So say V button, close that off. And this button is going to say projects. I make this one line, save that. Cool. So it looks kind of messed up, but we're going to fix that in a second. So inside button, if I were to say make that flat, save that, that's going to make it a flat button. So it looks a little bit better. And then we also kind of want an icon. So I'm going to do V icon. I want to put a playlist add check icon. Here. Let me just make this into a new line so it's a read. Cool, so we have a button that says projects and it has a little icon to the left of it so people can understand that that's like your main view for seeing your projects and to-do list items. One thing I want to fix really quick is this margin here that needs to be added. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to that title here and I'm just going to add a class of MR-4, which means margin right 4, and that's going to push that button over to the right some so it looks a little bit cleaner. And then later we can come along and add like routing here to the header if we need to. But let's finish off with adding a couple of more. So we're going to need a register button. We're going to need a logout button. And we're going to need a login button. And I also want to include some icons on those. I just like putting icons next to my buttons, although I'm not sure if that's good UX or not. So for register, I'm going to say count box. For login, I want to do fingerprint. And then for logout, I want to say exit to app. And then also I want to add a button that says how this was made, which is basically just going to be a link to this YouTube video. Awesome. So we have a bunch of different buttons. And of course, as we go on, we're going to hide them and show them depending on if the user was logged in or whatnot. Um, one thing I do want to fix really quick is that all these buttons are really close to the text. So I'm just going to add a little bit of margin to all of these buttons here. So wherever I see flat, I'm just going to say class of margin right of two. Save that. And notice that all of our buttons. Actually, I think I should have used um, padding right. So PR2 is a way to add padding to stuff. MR2 is a way to add like margin to stuff. I think I added it to the wrong stuff. Yeah, my bad, my bad. I added it to the wrong thing. I should have instead added it to the V icons here. So if I just grab all the icons and just do class of margin right 2, that should make it look a little bit better. So sorry, I'm kind of recording this early in the morning. I'm still like trying to wake up and I'm making a lot of mistakes, but hopefully I'm still explaining this decently. Okay, so let's move on to refactoring this a little bit. Because if you see here, this app.view file could potentially get pretty big. Right now I'm already hitting like 30 lines. And it's good to kind of decouple your components so it's easier to understand. So it would make sense to pull this out into a separate component, right? Because these buttons down here, like when we have our content, the router view doesn't need to know about the toolbar header. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first copy and paste this. Actually, in fact, I'm going to cut it. And I'm going to make a new component called toolbar. And then I'm going to scaffold that out. And I'm going to paste that um, HTML inside of that template.
go ahead and save that. And then in my app.view, I could just include that toolbar after I import it. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and add a script, JavaScript, and then I'm going to import that component that we just created. So at slash components slash toolbar dot view. And then in here, we want to simply do components. <clears throat> and that's going to be an object with the name of our component. Right here it says we're missing a semicolon, so let's go ahead and add a semicolon. Make sure my linting is all working. Trailing space inside of my HTML, so let's fix that really quick. I'm missing in my call bars and fix that. Okay, so all those are passing now. So the last part or step I need to do is once I've imported that toolbar into my app.view, I can just go up here and simply do the toolbar. Notice here the toolbar is still displaying, and if I were to go back to my code and just comment that out to demonstrate, the toolbar will disappear. All right, so the next component or view I want to work on is going to be the register view so that we can actually register users. So let's go ahead and get started on that. If we go to our toolbar, notice that we had a register button. If we wanted that to actually do something when we clicked it, we could simply add the property to and pass it the URL we want to redirect the user to when they click on the button. So I'm going to say to slash register. At this point, we don't have a register view or route created. I'm going to go to my router.js file and I'm going to create one. I'll just go ahead and copy and paste what's there already and make this register. And that's going to be a register component. <clears throat> and again, we don't have a register component created. So what we need to do is pretend like we have one created in our views folder. And I will go here and just go ahead and create a new register.view file inside of this and go ahead and scaffold that up. Cool. So now at this point, actually, I'm just going to say, I'll make this H1. I'm just going to say register. Let's just make sure that we can view something. So if I go back to my UI, I should be able to click on that register on the top nav. And it's going to redirect us to that register view. And in this case, it's not. So let's kind of investigate what's going on. Going back to the toolbar. And it's because I put it on the wrong element. So I should have put it on the button, not the V icon. So that's my bad. And let me go back here, add it to V button. So let's go back, click on register now. And notice that it redirects us to a slash register endpoint. Anyway, so now that we have the register endpoint, a register route, let's go ahead and add a couple of things to that view, such as, you know, a login button, a username they can enter in a password form. So we don't need the toolbar at this point. We're done with the router, done with app. So inside the register component, what we need to do is let's go ahead and make this a div for now. We can come back and change that to probably like something that's more layout specific. And we need to create, I'm going to say a title of H1. So it's going to say register. And then we're going to need an input um, box. And using Vutify, there's one called vTextField. So I'm going to say vTextField. And the properties that you can pass to vText field include the label. I'm going to say email. I'm going to say uh, the value. So we'll leave that blank for now. I'm just going to do label email placeholder equals email. And we'll come back in a second and add actual uh, some other values to it. 
Then of course we need one for password. This is going to be a type of password. I'm going to make, I'm going to make it autocomplete equals false or actually equals new password so that Chrome doesn't automatically fill it in with stuff. So we have two text fields. We have email and password here and then we also need like a register button. So I'm going to add a V button. And in that V button, what we can do is give it a color. So I'm going to say color green. I'm going to give it dark so that the text is white. And then inside here, we can say register. Go ahead and give it an icon since I like to give icons next to my buttons. So a good icon that we could use here includes a account icon. So let's do account circle, save that, I go back, we have a register button here now. All right, so we're making some progress. One thing I'll notice is that, you know, I don't want this to expand the entire page width. So if we were to go back to our component, instead of using a div, let's do an actual container. So I'll say V container. And then make sure we update the closing element. And then inside the container, you can do a V layout, row wrap. And again, these are just Vuetify built in components for layout. So I have a container, I have a layout saying that everything should be in a row. And then I'm saying inside that row, I want the row to be width of six on a small. And then push everything to the right by three. I'll explain that one second. So let me save that. And now notice here you have everything kind of centered here. So basically, we go back to these attributes, I told it to give it a width of six. Basically, it's going to divide your page into 12 different columns. I'm saying this is going to be six columns of width. And then I want to push it over three columns. So this is column one, two, three, starts at column four, with the six, and then we have columns seven, eight, nine, ten, um, eleven, twelve. You could also probably visualize that here if I go and look at this. We have a width of six columns here, and then we're pushed over three. So if you notice, the three is adding a padding right here. This should allow us to, when we resize the page, it's still going to stay in the center. kind of gives us the benefit of responsive websites without having to do much work. But we're not focusing on making a responsive website. So let's keep on moving on and try to implement the actual registration login um, functionality. Cool. So now we're getting into the actual logic of this registration page. And we need to first start figuring out how to bind stuff to Vuex. So for anyone who's not really familiar with UX, basically it's a place where you have all of your application logic stored in a single place. And then your components are going to update that state and fire off actions and mutations to change the state. I guess the benefit of that is just it's very easy to understand like where all your application is. Like how does your application change over time? We'll we'll kind of debug and show you how useful that is in a second. But Again, let's just implement it and I'll kind of explain it along the way. So we need to, first of all, go into our store and let's make a new file called authentication. And this could be named whatever you want, it doesn't really matter. Um, and inside that authentication file, we want to export a new object, which is gonna be like a store module. So I'm going to say this is going to be namespace of true. The state in here is going to have some things. We can kind of add on to it in a second. <laughs> and before we start adding on to this, let's go ahead and make sure that we include that module here in our main store. So up here, you're able to do modules and include a list of modules here. So I want to include a authentication module. which of course we haven't imported yet. So I'm gonna say import authentication from authentication. And that's basically going to 
pull in this default object here and put it directly into my modules um, object here. So then I'll be able to access it with my mutations and actions and setters and stuff from my view components. And again, this probably won't make sense until we start using it. So just a recap, we made a module and we included it in our store. So let's go back to our module. What do we actually need to store in our state? So if we were to look at a register component, basically we need to store when they update their email that they're about to submit, when they update their password. Okay, so two things that we know that we need to um, keep track of. So let's keep track of register email. It's going to be null by default and register password. <clears throat> That's also going to be null. So in order to kind of bind these, to change these, we need to first make a couple of mutations. So if I go here, I'm going to add another property called mutations. Hmm. And inside this mutations property, we can just define different functions that will affect our state here. So I'm going to say set register email. That's going to stake or take a state and also a <clears throat> an email as a payload. And then we need the same thing for set register password. So state dot register email is email. Same thing here, register password is equal to password. I think this is just because um, we spun this up using Airbnb's ES ESLint, and they typically use React, but we need to actually be able to do this. So let's go to our ESLint file, and let's add some rules. So I'm gonna say rules, the one that's giving us issues is no param reassign. And I'm just going to turn that off for now so that we don't get that error. And unfortunately, when you change that ESLint file, you have to rerun your serve command. I think there's a couple of other ones we might, a couple of other rules we might add and disable mainly because, you know, everyone has their own opinions of how their code should look. And I have my own, of course. So <clears throat> let's let that reload here. Cool. So a little recap, we have two properties on our authentication module state called register email and register password. And then we have two mutations, which we can use to change those. So with that being said, how do we actually bind our view component to change those? So if we go back to our register.view file, what we need to do is first import our um, a couple of helper functions from Vuex. So I'm first going to do import map state, and I'm going to do map mutations from Vuex. And to use these, basically you just kind of decorate your component object with calling these functions. So for an example, if we wanted the ability to call set password or set registration email from one of these, we need to map the mutations to our object. So I'm going to say map mutations. Actually, first of all, I need to bind that to a method. So I'm going to say methods is an object. And then I want to map some mutations to that. That's a function where I can pass it the module name. So authentication. And then I pass it the methods I actually want to map. So this is the first function that we want to map. And this is the second function we want. So basically all this is doing is saying that this component is going to have these two methods that it can call. So up here I can call those. So like whenever I click on register or whenever I change text in here, I can simply just call those methods here. And then also what we want to do is we want to grab in our computed state values here so that we can set a register email and password when that view loads. So up here, I'm going to say computed, which is another property you can use on your view component. And instead of map mutations, I'm going to say map state. Again, pass it the module name that we want to map and then pass it our state that we want to map in. In this case, I'm going to say register email and register password.
All right, so if everything worked well, I should be able to start using these. So the first thing I want to do is I want to go up here and I want to bind the value of my text fields to its corresponding state value. So I'm going to say value is equal to register email. That's going to bind this text field to whatever the state value is down here. And then I want to do the same thing for a register password. So I'm going to go down here and say bind this to register password. And let's just demonstrate what we are actually doing here. So if I go back to this view, the register view, notice that email and password are not set to anything. And that's because in our state, if I go to the authentication module, I actually clear out my local storage. I think I have some stuff left. Okay. So in our authentication module, we have a register email and register password state, and those are both null. But if I come back to here and say hello, and this changes the world and save this, notice that when this page refreshes, um, I think it's because I'm using, hold on. One second, to kind of show you what I'm doing, I need to actually disable this plugin because this is trying to load my state from the store, which is not what we want to do to be able to demonstrate this. Uh, sometimes I hate ASLint. There we go. So sorry about that. Basically, I changed the st initial state of these two properties to be hello world, and notice that our inputs are set to those now. I'm gonna keep this plugin disabled for right now so it doesn't cause more issues. Come back and enable it in a second. So again, if I change that and add yo to the end of it, when this page loads, this input is going to fetch that value from the store and just populate it. So that's kind of the first step. We bound these text fields to the state. Now the second part is we need to bind um, what happens when we input into this and update our store. So if I do at input, so basically whenever someone changed the values of this text field, sorry, all we want to do is just call set register email down here. And then same thing for the password. I'm going to say set register password. So now when I type, you'll notice that it's firing off a Vuex mutation down here, authentication slash set register email. And as that's changing, it's updating our state. So in, another cool thing I can show is we can travel back in time to all the different values of our state. So if I wanted to go back to when my app first loaded, notice that it's going to load my initial store values here. And that's reflected in our UI. And I kind of I can kind of step through what happened over time with my component. And this is really useful for debugging and understanding what's going on with your application. Let's go back to our code and try to figure out what else is remaining. So we had the ability to type into the email and password. We're updating our store with the corresponding values. Now what we want to do is when the user clicks register, we want to fire off a Vuex action to kind of hit that register endpoint we created on our previous tutorial section. So on this button, I'm going to add an at click callback. And I'm going to call the register method, which we haven't included yet. So if I go down here now and just pretend that the authentication has a register action, I'm going to say map actions, authentication, I bring in that register action. And of course, we are missing this, so we need to include it up here. If we go back to our authentication module, we need to just simply add in actions and say register is going to take um this register need. The register you can do object deconstruction and just grab the commit 
function and also grab the state. So now we're getting into doing actual HTTP requests to our server, which is running. So in this particular case, we want to grab the register email and password, and we want to do a post request to our register endpoint. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I want to make a new component called HTTP.js. So I'm going to do HTTP.js. And inside here, we're going to export a function, which is going to return a new Axios object. So I'm going to say Axios.create. And we haven't included that, so let's just do that really quick. And we also probably want the store because I'm going to put the base URL in the store. And before we go further with implementing this, let's go to our store and just add a base URL and set that equal to API. I think actually should slash API. So in this HTTP file, we're going to create an Axios object and we're going to set the base URL. So I'm gonna say base URL is equal to store.state.base URL. And then we wanna say, give it a timeout of like one second. So if a request doesn't finish in a second, time it out. <clears throat> and that should be good for right now. So just make sure we add our semicolons. This is another one I do not like, so I'm going to disable that style. If I go back to my ESLint, just get rid of that. Of course, make sure you reset that. We can now go into our authentication action that we're trying to create, import this HTTP function so we can create an Axios module. So up here, I'm going to import HTTP from HTTP. And now we have the ability to call that function. So here, I'm just gonna say return HTTP.post. The reason we can call that post is because on this Axios object, it has different methods such as get, post, patch, put, delete, stuff like that. And we want to make a post request to our auth slash register endpoint. And then we need to pass it some data in the body payload. So I'm going to say email is equal to uh, state.register email. And then password is equal to state.register password. I'm going to make it so the moment we call this action, I just want to reset my username and password back to what it was. So I'm going to say commit set registration. Actually, um, we don't even need commit at this point. So let me just save that. Show you what happens when we run this method. So if you remember, we already bound this register button to make send off an action event. So if I click it, we're actually getting an error now. So let's see. Does localhost 8080 slash API slash office register is not found. Um, and the main issue here is if you remember, we are hosting our API in port 3333. And this is trying to make a request to 8080. Another cool thing you can do is we just want to pretend that the API and the UI are going to be hosted on the same port, same domain under a proxy. So if we go back to our main folder where we have or our client folder, I can make a new file called view.config.js. And inside here, if I just export an object that has dev server as a property and I tell it to proxy slash API, I can give it a target and tell it to point to my Adonis server on port 3333. Close off all the And I think I might need to restart my server. This is basically just doing a proxy. Whenever I do a request to slash API, it's going to point to a different port on this machine. And viewconfig.js is automatically kind of loaded in when you're using the view CLI. So let's go back to our UI when that refreshes. Let's click the register button again. Go back to register here.
So if you see here, we try to make a request to 8080 slash API slash auth slash register. The request payload is this. Hello, yo, password is world. But for some reason, the server did not respond within a second. So let's just see if that was a fluke. And it doesn't seem like it was. So let's look at our server. Maybe our server is actually crashing for some reason. Let me go to my server folder and go to my controller where I'm trying to register. And let me just make sure I'm hitting this. So I'll say console.log hello world. So we are hitting this endpoint. I think it's just taking a little bit longer than a second to register our user. So let's go back to our HTTP, change this timeout to five seconds instead. And let's try to hit that endpoint again. Okay, we're getting an error. I think it's saying that the user already exists and it does. I'll do hello with an exclamation mark. Try to register that user instead. Cool. Okay, this one actually worked. So we got back that token, um, which we're going to need to store in our store at some point. Uh, but right now you saw there's no feedback for the user when we registered. And what we want to do is A, store the token in the store, and then we want to redirect the user to a different view. Go back to this, get rid of the hello world, and just start that. <clears throat> Go back to review CLI. Close some of these files. Okay, so first thing we wanted to do is we said we wanted to store the token inside the store. So if I do a dot then, we can grab data that's returned from the Axios request. And then inside this data, we can simply do commit set token data dot token. Of course, we don't have a commit or a mutation called set token, so let's add one. We'll say set token, we get the state, we get the token, and we need to set state.token is equal to token. And we also don't have a token defined in our state, so let's go up here and say token is equal to null. And also, let's make sure we include commit up here so we can run the commit. So let's try this. See what happens if we were to register with a new user that we haven't done before. I click register. Notice that it fires off the set token mutation. And now in our state, we have a token set. So that's step one. Step two is we need to change our router location. So we need to first import that router. So import router from dot dot slash router just to import this file here. And then if we want to dynamically change the route that we're on, we can do router.push. I'm going to say go to the root. So let's try registering with yet another one. So I'll just say hello, click register, and notice that it redirected us when we successfully logged in. So a couple of other things we want to do is what if there was a login error, right? What if the user tried to log in and it was incorrect? So we should probably display some sort of registration error on this page. So to do that, we're going to need yet another store variable called a register error. It's going to be null by default. We want a mutation to be able to set register error. And then in our register.view file, we want to add a new alert, probably add it right above the register button. So I'll say v alert, right in that component. And I'm going to give it a couple of properties. So I'm going to give it type of error. And I want to give it a value of error. I shall say register error. So basically, if register error is defined, it should show up this alert. 
And notice register error we haven't brought in. So we need to go back down here to methods and make sure we map the state here. So I'm going to map the register error state. And I also want to just go ahead and say, um, actually, we don't need to map any mutations here. So right now, that's not going to show up regardless because we don't have a way to actually check. Or we, we don't have anything setting register error. So let's go back to our action. And what we want to do in our action is if there is some type of error. So if I do dot catch. I want to go ahead and just set the register error. So I'm going to say commit set register error. I'm going to say invalid registration formation. And of course, you can get more specific. I think you could probably catch the actual error and do something with it. Actually, instead, I'm going to say an error has occurred trying to create your account. All righty, so hopefully this works. If we go back and try to register this exact same user that should already exist in the database, we get an error back. And right now the error is not displaying anything. So to debug this, let's look. We sent off a mutation to set register error. That changed our authentication modules register error store state, or whatever it's called, state, to a string. But for whatever reason, we're not displaying that in our alert. Oh, and this is because I forgot to actually render the text. <laughs> so if you read through the Beautify docs alert, this value is just going to display it if this is true or defined and then not display it if it's false. But you actually need to render something inside here. So make sure you do the mustache handlebar stuff to register to display your text. Cool. So now it says an error has occurred trying to create your account. If I try to create it again with something that doesn't have an error, it's going to redirect us. And then one thing I'm going to do is every time we try to register, I'm just going to commit null. So I reset that back to nothing from our registration error. Cool, so I think we're like close to being done. If not, we are done with this register view. Um, I think the last thing I want to do is once you're registered, I want to hide a couple of these things in the top toolbar. And if you're not logged in, I want to show them. So let's add something new that we haven't seen yet called a getter to our authentication module. So I'm going to say getters it's going to be another property. And inside here, I'm going to say is logged in which is a function which takes the state, I believe. And what we want to do here is basically just return true or false, depending on if the token set. So if the token is set, it's going to be true or logged in. If it's not, it's going to be false. And now that we've done that, we can actually go back to our toolbar component and hide these different buttons depending on if we're logged in or not. So let's go ahead and import um, that map getters function. So say import um, object deconstruction of map getters from Vuex. And here I'm going to say computed is equal to map getters of the authentication module. And then I want to say is logged in. So that will basically grab us that getter function and we can call it up here to display and hide different things. So if we are logged in, we want to display logout. I'm going to say v if we are logged in. Uh, this should always be displayed. Register and login should not be displayed. So I'm going to go ahead and just hide those two buttons there. 
say if we're not logged in, we can display those. And up here, we probably only want to display this if we're logged in. So let's go ahead and save that and see what happens. All right, so right now token is null, so we're not logged in. But if I were to register with something new, such as like Hello World 999, when we log in, we now get that projects button to show up. We get that logout button to show up. All right, so let's go ahead and commit what we have for now and then we move on to some functionality. So since we're here messing with the toolbar, let's just go ahead and make um, the logout button actually log us out. So what is logging out? Basically, in our sense of our application, it's just going to be setting that token to null, right? So if we go back to our authentication, remember we have a set token mutation, which we can call. So if I just go to the toolbar, I want to make sure I map that mutation. And I'll say methods is equal to map mutations, pass it authentication, pass it that function that we want to be able to use. And then now that we have that function mapped, I could simply go up here to log out. And if we click that button, I want to set token to null. So if we go back here, did it refresh the page? Okay, so notice here when I clicked logout, register went away, or sorry, the uh, projects button went away, and the logout button went away. Now we're showed register and login, and we can also check the store. Notice that token is set to null now. Um, I think what we also want to do, though, is we want to redirect the user to the login page whenever we click logout. So maybe instead of mapping a mutation, we could either create an action or we could just create the, the logout functionality here. So I think it'd be better to just create an action called logout. So if I go back to authentication, make a new action called logout. That only needs a commit. Basically, we're going to do the same thing. So commit, set token to null. And then we need to do router.push slash login. Which I don't think we have a route for login yet, so, but we will create that in a second. So going back to the toolbar, instead of doing map mutations, I'm going to say map actions. And I'm going to bring out the logout action. I'm just going to call logout here. So let's just make some user and log them in. And now that we click log out, it should redirect us to login, which we don't have a really a view created for that yet, but we can do that in a second. Cool. So what we haven't implemented yet is the ability for a user to log in. So let's go ahead and try to do that now. Let's go back to our, actually, let me just commit log out here, get to further. If I go to my view and I'm going to make a new component called login and I'm just going to copy and paste from register because it's going to be basically the same thing uh, with different mutations and actions. Oops. Login. Okay. So copy the register component and made a login view here. If I go to router, let's go ahead and make a, a login mm. route. And inside the login route, let's just do login here. So this is all showing up. All right, so now we have login. Instead of register for the button, we need to say login. So I'm gonna go down here to the button. I'm gonna say fingerprint, I'm gonna say login, save that. Okay, that's good to go. Um, instead of register, register error, I'm just going to rename all everywhere I see register to login. So, that 
Actually, this is going to be. Let me um just do this manually so I don't mess up the localization. <clears throat> so register should become login. Register should become login. All right, so none of these states, mutations, or actions actually exists on the authentication. So let's go ahead and add those two. So I'm going to say, instead of register email, password, and email, or error, I'm going to say login. <clears throat> and then for actions, instead of a register action, we also need a login action. Set to login error. Null. Login. Same functionality, basically. In fact, we could probably abstract this to a function since this is very, very similar. But to keep it simple, I'm just going to repeat myself. You notice here, same, same method. We're just basically changing the URL and we're changing the error and the parameters that we're sending in. So we could just make a helper function up here that does uh, kind of shared code between register and login, but that's another abstraction which kind of makes stuff a little bit harder to understand. We just want to quickly look at code. So let's not worry about that right now. So again, we have a login action which should work now. It tries to log into that login endpoint with the login email and login password. If there's an error, we'll display in the alert. If not, we're going to push the token or set the token and then we redirect to the home page. And now we just need the mutations for those three store values that we added. So I'm going to say sets, set login, and then here I'm just going to say state login. All right, so let's see if this works. So first I'm going to go to register. I'm going to make testing at gmail.com. Password one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to register. And this failed because I think that user already exists. Sure does. So I'll do testing one then. Register that. I'm going to log out and then make sure that login works as a. This was testing one. I'm going to log in with that same username and password. And at worked as well. Awesome. So we have register and we have login working. We have logout working. We're hiding and showing different buttons based on the token being set. Um, let's go ahead and admit what we have for this login functionality, and then we can move on to something else. So let's move on to actually displaying the ability to like add projects and add tasks and stuff like that. So the first thing we need to start out with is kind of like a projects panel. Um, so if we go to the main view here, our home view, this is kind of what we're looking at right here. So I'm going to actually rename this to projects. And in my router, I'm just going to go ahead and change that to file. Instead of home, I'm going to say projects. I'm going to change that to projects. Projects. Go ahead and get rid of all this stuff. We'll come back and add more stuff in in a second. All right, so on this projects page, the first thing I want to kind of display is a panel on the left with a title that says projects. And then inside that panel, I want to display a list of my projects and then an input box at the bottom so we can create a new project. So, first thing is, whole idea of a panel is something that we're going to be using throughout the application. So if we go to our components folder and just make a new one called panel.view, go ahead and scaffold that out. 
all I want to do here is I'm going to make a div. Give us some classes which are kind of pre-built into Beautify. So I'm going to say white, I'm right, I'm going to say white, then elevation of two. And that's just going to make a, a raised white panel. And inside that raised white panel, or card I mean, I want to declare a toolbar. And I want to make sure that it is flat. I'm going to say dense, I'm going to say dark, and I'm going to say color of Then inside that toolbar, I want to say be toolbar title is going to be equal to whatever the user passed in, in a property. So I'm going to say title is something that a user can pass into this component. Then down here, of course, we're going to need props. I'm going to say title is going to be a string. Then inside the title, Actually, I think that's good enough for the title. Um, underneath the toolbar, what we want to do is create something called a slot. So I'm going to say div class of padding left four, padding right four, padding top of two, padding bottom of two. And inside of that div, I'm just going to add a slot. And if no one passes anything, I'm going to say no slot content find. All right. So now we have a panel which we can kind of use throughout our application. And then, of course, we need to define it as a global. So I'm going to say here, I'm going to say view component, component.panel is equal to panel. And then, of course, make sure you bring that in. Panel, and bring that in from that view. So almost done. In the projects.view file now, we could just simply do a panel here. Then I'm going to pass it title is equal to projects. So now when we save this, we should see a panel that is defined here. So we have projects here with no slot content defined. And if we wanted to make something render here, we just simply pass it in here. So I'm going to say h1 testing. Notice that that title will then render here. And we can render whatever we want inside of this. Cool, so we made a shared component or a global component called panel, which we can use throughout our application. Um, let's go ahead and do some layout here so that it's not right next to the side of it. So instead of using a div home, I'm just gonna do a v container. So v container. Actually, I'm going to leave that out for now. Come back. Then in the container, we want a V layout. And in the V layout, of course, we want a V flex. And this flex is going to be, um, I'm going to say small of four. So it's going to be four columns. And then inside there, I'm going to put our panel. All right, so now we have a panel to the left called projects, and let's just go ahead and create one for now, just so we kind of have a better visualization of what we're doing on the right. So eight plus four is 12, and this one is going to be called tasks. So projects and tasks. Awesome, and let's just add a little bit of padding to that class as you go. Cool. So again, what I said we're doing is we're just going to render out um, a text field here where we can add a new project, and then we're going to, we need to render out a list of those projects. <clears throat> so before we get too ahead of ourselves, let's make a new component called projects.view. It might be a little confusing because we have a view called projects and we have a component called projects. So I need to rename this to projects view or something, but I'll just, I'll keep it as is and see how confusing it is. 
So inside here, let's just go ahead and import projects from to at components slash projects dot view. I'll say components is equal to projects. I'm gonna go ahead and just instead of doing this panel here, I'm going to just render that projects thing. That we're going to start defining. And then I'll put the panel inside the projects. Let's see, Let me make a different error because it doesn't have a semicolon. All right. So now we have this kind of refactored, so it's just simply going to be projects, and this will probably just say tasks in a bit. And in our projects panel, what we want to do is we want to list out text field so that they can create, or we can create a record. So inside here, I'm going to say, give me a text field. And we just want to kind of like allow the user to type in the new name of their project. So I'm going to say, let's see, placeholder is going to be my project name dot dot dot. Save this and make sure everything is correctly. All right, so we have a text field called my project name. And then we also need like a submit button. So I'm going to say B button. That's going to have a create on it. In fact, let's just do a little bit of um, flex grid stuff so we can lay it out. So here I'm going to say inside here it's going to be B, B layout. And of course we need the V flex. This will throw wrap. This is basically so we can have a button on the right text field on the left. So let's just do this, put the text field in the V8 or the small eight. And I'm gonna put the button. Cool. And of course, I like adding icons to my button. So let's just add a V icon here. Add circle, save that. Awesome, and of course we should do a little bit of margin right. Mm -hmm. And we can fix the style and stuff in a second. So let's see, the button should probably also be color of green. Uh, let's give it a margin top of two. So it just moves down a little bit. Let's give it dark and see what happens. All right, so we have a create button now that looks a little bit nicer. It's a little bit down further to line up with this. Mm. So similar to what we did at the login register, we need to listen to when the keys change on the text field and then update the store. And of course, we also need to set the value to something that's coming from the store. So if I were to go back to my store, Let's just assume that we have another module called projects.js. Just to simply copy and paste what we have here. We're going to be needing to reuse that like HTTP stuff. So let's just do actions, getters, state and stuff. So we're just good to go now. And of course, in the main index.js file, we need to include that. So let's include that projects module here. And now we should be able to use that in our view application. So first thing is I'm going to create something in our state called new project name. It's going to be null. And then I need a mutation to set, set new project name. That's going to be um, state and name. 
So state that new project name is equal to name. So then here, of course, we need to bind value. It's going to be new project name. We need to make sure we include those. So import map mutations, map state from view X. Then computed, we're going to say map state of projects now because we're using the projects module. Then we need a new project. And then for methods, app mutations, set new project name. So again, when we do inputs, we just need to pass set new project name. All right, so let's verify that this is working as expected. So I'm going to type hello. That's sending off the mutations for set project name. And we're seeing that update get reflected here in the Vuex state. <clears throat> so I guess the last step is we just need to send off an action to the backend to actually create this project name once we click that submit button. So if we go back to the projects module, Fact, let me just copy and paste one of the actions here so we have a good starting point. I'm going to say create project. And that's going to take a commit and a uh, state. So that's going to do an HTTP request to projects. It's going to do a post request and then we're going to pass the title. So state that new project name. In fact, I probably should call that new project title. So let us maybe refactor that. But anyway, once that's successful, what we're going to do is we're just going to commit um, end project data. And let's not worry about errors right now. And then we'd have a projects array here, which we'd probably loop over at some point. Hmm. So what we need to do is in the mutations, make a new one called end project. I'm going to say date.projects.push project. Just so we can keep track of the new projects we create. And then, of course, we need to set the project name successful to back to null. So set new project name, say null. Um, so I think we're almost done with this, but the only thing we're missing is the whole header. So if I go back to HTTP here, I need to make sure I add a header. So I'm going to say headers is equal to authorization. That's going to be bearer. I'm going to grab from the store the token from the authentication module that we have. Mm. All right, so we did a lot of stuff. Let's just check to see what errors we may have. So I'm going to type in a new project name called Hello World. And then when I click Create, we forgot to bind the create project. So let's go back here and for map actions. We need to make sure we include that method. And then when we click this, just need to make sure we call it. Let's try again, Hit create. Sending off a request to API slash projects, rating a 401 unauthorized. So let's look at the network tab and see what's going on here. Mm. Saying my JWT is malformed. 
Um, so let's look at the headers. And for some reason, the token is not on the headers. So let's go back to HTTP. Did I maybe spell something? Headers, authorization, error, state authentication. <clears throat> maybe it just didn't refresh the page correctly. So let me just do a hard refresh here. Do hello world. Click create. Oh, okay. so the issue is, is we're not even logged in. So I don't think we should be showing this view if we're not logged in. So there may be a different way and I'll probably look this up to see if there's a different way to redirect. But if we try to hit the projects page here or the projects view without being logged in, I'm gonna say mounted is a function. And then when we're mounted, just check to see if the token we don't have, so I need to do comp you did map state authentication. Actually, no map hitters is logged in. So if we're not logged in, go ahead and redirect to the login page. Map getters is not defined. I forgot to import it. So map getters from view X. What happens here? All right, so now it's going to make me log in every time. So if I type hello world here now, create that. It's going to append the project. So now I have a projects array here. It created the project successfully in our back end. Um, the only thing we need to do now is just kind of display it in a list. So to visualize that really quickly, inside of my projects panel up here, I'm just going to create a div. Inside the div, I'm just going to loop over my projects. So v4 project in projects. and make sure you map the project state. So I'm gonna say projects. We could simply just render out the project.title here if we wanted to. Oh, I need a vbind. The key is gonna be project.id. Like to return at okay that one yeah okay, I don't like this um ESLint so I'm gonna just this one just reset to my serve. See, absolute import should come before, so this is at the top. All right, so I'm going to log, log in now. 
my awesome project. And I click create. Notice that the project is now rendered because we did a V4. So I'm making some progress. Let me just go ahead and commit what we have and we can come back and create more logic in a second. So the next thing we want to do is when the projects component is mounted, we want to fetch all the projects that the user has and just render it in this list here. Because if I were to, you know, restart this page or refresh this page um, and log back in, notice that we did create projects on that user, but there's nothing that's showing up. So let's move back to that projects.view file. And let's also open up the project store and let's create a new action called fetch projects. Take the, it's going to take the commit function and the state. And what we're going to do here is just return the same thing that we did before. One second. All right. So we're going to do an HTTP method. So we create that object and we're going to do a get request on projects. And of course, we don't need to pass it any parameters since it should just return everything that is attached to that projects. And once we get our project data back, actually, we don't need state here. We're going to do a new commit called set projects. And the back end is going to return an array, so data is going to be an array of projects already. So if we're doing a commit action, we need to make sure we create that um, mutation. So I'm going to go down here and say set projects, state projects. And then I'm just going to simply overwrite state.projects is equal to projects. And we already have it defined as an empty array here, so we should be good to go. Um, let me save this. And now we should be able to map those actions and call that when our project's component is mounted. So let's go to our project's component since I'm in the project's view right now. And what we want to do is when this component is mounted, we are going to fetch the projects. So I simply just need to go up here um, at a mounted function call and then I need to say this dot fetch projects so as simple as that it's going to run that action which is going to commit that project's data and we should see that reflected so I'm going to log in we see that it called set projects here which the payload returned was an array of two projects so projects is set on the state here. So projects and then inside projects, we have another attribute called projects. Might be a little confusing, but hey, it works. And then you see that those are rendered up here. And we can also go to our network tab and see that we made a request to our projects endpoint at API slash projects. Look at the response and we have two projects returned. So pretty straightforward as to how to fetch projects and how to create projects now. The two other pieces of functionality we kind of need for projects is we need to be able to edit this title and we need to be able to, to delete the project. Hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to add a button here, which is like a pencil button. And when you click it, it's going to make this become a text field so that we can edit it as needed. So let's go back to our projects.view file and find where we are rendering that project title, which is here on line seven. <clears throat> so instead of rendering that, let's just go ahead and make an icon, which is going to be a pencil. I think it's called pencil. I guess we'll find out in a second. Mm. And I'll have to do a little bit of layout slash vflex to get this to work out correctly. In fact, that should, that should say edit, not pencil. Hmm. So save that. We have pencils next to our text now, which is a step in the right direction. Um, we want to make sure that the layout is set up correctly. 
So let's just go ahead and do a V layout here. And in here, let's do a V flex. And we want this to be, I don't know, let's just say a V flex a nine and the rest could be a three. Let's make the title be on the left and we can make that edit button be on the right. <clears throat> okay, so making some progress. Um, let's align the text to the left. So on the the flex here, I can say class, let's say text x xs left, and that's a built-in class for Beautify to kind of align stuff to the left. So all of my text will be aligned to the left now. Um, I'll just add a little bit of margin to the bottom of these. So let's see, for each div, I'm gonna do a class of margin bottom of two and see if that's enough. Looks a little bit better. And of course, I'm gonna say that this is a project. Down here, I'm gonna make a new style called dot project and that's going to say margin, or that's gonna be font size of 18 pixels. See if that's big enough. That looks okay. Be something bigger like 24. And then in fact, I think I want to add a little bit of space above this. So if we go to the panel, I'm going to say class is um, adding top of four and see if that pushes it down. Oops, I put that on the wrong thing. So I'm just going to do margin top of two here instead. There we go. So that looks a little better. And then this is going to give it a little bit of margin two. The margin top of four, just to push that whole thing down, give a little bit of space. All right. So again, what we're trying to do is when we click on this edit button, we want to change this to a V text field so that we can edit the Hello World project title. So if I go back to where we are rendering that title out here, we're going to kind of have two things um, that need to interchange depending on if the project is in edit mode or if it's not in edit mode. So um, let's just pretend that project has an is edit mode Boolean. So I'm going to do a span and say, B if project dot is edit mode, we're going to display something, which is going to be the project title. Otherwise, we're going to display a V text field, V text field. And again, we do the opposite of that. And you could probably use a switch case as well. I think you has a switch case support. So I say, if it's not in edit mode, we're simply not going to display the text field. Okay. Then inside this text field, we're going to do value is going to be equal to project.title. Go back to this. Save this and make sure this is displaying correctly. Have Ban extra space. And I think I have these swapped, so that needs to be if it is edit mode, and this needs to be if it's not edit mode. <clears throat> okay, so you saw it was displaying a text field before, and that was um, just because I had the Boolean swapped. So now if I click on this icon, what we want to do is change the project's is edit mode boolean to true. So down here for the button, I'm going to say at click um, set edit mode and pass it the project here. So let's go and actually 
pretend like we have a mutation that we can call. So here we're going to map mutations and call set edit mode. And that needs to be uh, true actually. So wherever I called set edit mode, let's just say that's going to be a value of true. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just keep it like that. So set edit mode. And if I go to projects and go to my mutations, let's just add another one called set edit mode state. And that's going to be the project. <sighs> then inside here, we're going to do project dot is edit mode is equal to. So let's see if that actually changes our state as we click things. Click this. Set edit mode is set down here. And is edit mode is edit mode is set to true. Now the issue that we're having here is nothing is being um, reflected in our state. And that's because is edit mode doesn't actually exist on the project. So this is kind of a, a nuance in regards to using view where the UI is only going to bind the stuff that actually exists. So what we need to do instead is if we go back, instead of doing project.isEditMode true, we need to first import view. And then down here, instead of just doing this, we need to say view.set project is edit mode, and then we need to pass it true. And this will kind of make sure that it binds correctly to that Boolean once we set it. But, oh, this needs to go above. All right, so if I go back, click this, notice that it changes to the text field. And right now we don't have a way to go back because we don't have like a cancel button or a check button. So let's kind of add that. So let's go back to our projects.view and I'm going to add a check down here. The so same, same idea It's going to have a check icon. When you click it, it's going to call unset edit mode. So we're going to assume that we have an unset edit mode. We're going to go to our project down here. And at this point, it's probably safe to assume that edit mode is defined on the project because it can't be true unless you set it. So I should be able to do project.isEditMode is equal to false, but just in case, let's just keep it as is like this. So if I go back, um, we should have a checkbox that shows up. Of course, we need to probably do a VF to display it and hide it. So if I click on the, the pencil, it'll go into edit mode. If I click on the check, it goes back to non-edit mode. Let's make sure we toggle those correctly. But going back here, let's find that check icon I created and I'm going to say V if project dot is edit mode is false. And then for this one, if the edit mode is true, we want to display a check. So now we can toggle between them. Pretty awesome. So let's go down to the style and let's just do. I think we want to make it so when we hover over this, we have a cursor. So what is this actually called? Icon, class of icon. So if we go to our style and say icon, cursor is a pointer. Just so we get some feedback as a user when we hover over stuff. We probably also want to say icon hover background. Actually, that should be color of make it gray, I guess. Not sure what color it was before. All right, so now it's a little bit darker when we hover over it. Cool. So we're kind of getting closer to implementing this edit functionality. So now if we were to change the value of hello world to what is up, something like that, notice that nothing changes because we haven't actually bound to the input callback on the project edit. So we need to go back and go here and say, add a new mutation called set project title, state project, Actually, this is going to be a 
message. So I'm going to say project title. And then project.title is equal to title. So we have a simple mutation where we can set the title. And if we go back to our projects view, we again need to make sure we grab that mutation. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that set project title from the projects module. And then when we change the value of this, I'm going to say at input, I want to go ahead and just call set project title. I want to pass it the event. I don't know if I need to do this. Let me just try this. So set project title is going to take a object and that object is going to have the project. So I'm going to say project and then also the title is going to be equal to the event. I think I might be getting some type of error, lint error or something. This is not on a single line. Oh, you know what I'm doing wrong? I have, I'm updating the wrong thing. Hold on. Input's declared twice on this. I'm updating the wrong text field. So if I go up here to the text field we're supposed to be updating, let me just add input to that. Um, so now we're calling set project title with the project and then the event, which is going to be, I think, the text. We may need to verify this in a second, but let's see what happens if we run this. So log in, and I'm going to go ahead and try to edit this by adding an exclamation mark. It, Dispatched that mutation, and we have the payload, we have the project, and we also have a new title that we want to change it to. So then if I go into my projects array, notice that the corresponding project has the exclamation mark. So we're now we're, we are reflecting the value of the title successfully. The last part is when we check, click the checkbox, we want to actually persist. So if I go back to that checkbox here, and instead of saying unset edit mode, I'm just going to say save project. Let's go back and pretend like there's an action called save. Let me get rid of unset edit mode for now. Now let's just be explicit and call it save project. And then go back to our actions or our projects module and create an action called say project. Basically, what we want to do is just send off a patch request to the endpoint that we have. So I'm going to say HTTP patch on projects slash project.id. And then this needs to be string interpolation, so we can use back ticks. Okay, there we go. And then of course we need to pass the project that we're trying to save. And that should hit the back end, save and actually persist the project, project state to the back end. Um, and when we get a response back, I'm not sure at this point we really need to do much. So we just let's just delete that for now. And for commit, what we want to do is actually, yes. Yeah, so if it saves successfully, what we're going to do is we're going to commit and say unset edit mode project. All right, so it's going to persist it. If it was successfully persisted to the back end, we then just disable or unset it from edit mode. So it's going back to the normal view. So let's try doing this and see what happens. So I'm going to go to the check uh, the pencil. Add a couple of exclamation marks and I click the checkbox. Notice that it went back to the normal view instead of the edit mode. And it made a network request to project slash two. We sent the payload of title, hello world, blah, blah, blah. And we got a response back of the new object. So now when I refresh the page and log back in, Notice that we have that item or that title persisted now. Cool. So we're making some good progress. We have the ability to create new projects. We have the ability to edit projects. 
Um, one thing that we don't have is when I click this edit button, it doesn't focus on this automatically. So a cool little attribute we can add to V text field is autofocus. So let me go and say autofocus here. So now whenever we click on that, it should automatically focus on there and it did. <clears throat> um, what we also want to do is if we press enter on our keyboard, it would be nice if it just does that save thing for us. So let's go to the text field. We're going to say key up dot enter. So basically if the user were to have a key up event on the enter, we're just going to say save project and pass it project. And this is basically doing the same thing as clicking the check button. So let's save that and see if that works. So I'm going to click a pencil, add something, click enter. Notice that that got persisted to project number three now. All right, so now we're kind of on the last step, which is basically we need to be able to delete um, a project from that list. So you know the drill, basically we're gonna have to have a new action called delete project. So I'm just gonna copy and paste this, call it delete project. It's gonna take a project, it's gonna make a delete request to project slash ID. We don't need the past data. And then once the project is successfully deleted, we want to remove project from our list. So we're gonna need a new mutation down here called remove project. And that's just going to splice out the project from the list. So I'm going to say state.projects.splice, state.projects.index of project, and then one. And this is how you remove something from an array. So it's just going to find the index where this one exists and just splice it from the array. So now in order to use that action, let's go back to our view component. Let's go ahead and bring that in. And let's go ahead and make a new button, our new icon, which is going to be a delete icon. And we're going to be calling delete project when we click it. So here, I'm going to say delete. We only want to show it when we are in edit mode. And then we want to call delete project on that. So if I go ahead and save that. Log back in. Let's see. Let's click on. Actually, we want to show it all the time, I think. So let's just get rid of the if statement completely. So now we always have that trash can that we, when we click, it's just gonna delete it. We go to the network tab, notice it made a delete request to project two. And if I were to refresh and log back in, that project has been deleted from the list. Go ahead and delete everything and see how it works. One thing I'll also notice is when I press enter on this text field, it does not create the project. So let's go ahead and try to implement that as well. So very similar to before, when we click on create or e up dot enter, we want to create the project. So here in the text field, when we do a key up, we just want to say create project, give it that function, go ahead and save this. Go back and now when I press enter on my keyboard, it's going to create it for us. Well, we made a lot of progress. Let's go ahead and commit what we have. This is going to be called edit and delete projects. All right, so before we move on to this tasks panel, I want to go ahead and abstract some things that we can reuse components because tasks is basically going to be very similar to this projects panel. So first thing I want to abstract is this bottom create thing or section that we have. I want to have a component which has a create button where I can change this text dynamically through a prop and then of course invoke different callback functions depending on what we want. So let's start with this right here. So if we go back to our projects.view file, notice that this bottom section here, 
we want this is what we want to kind of abstract into a separate component. So down here, I'm going to say a new file called create record dot view. Go ahead and scaffold that up. And that's going to have that same layout code that we had in the other file. And let me just go ahead and pretend like that doesn't even exist here. So say create record. Make sure we have the components, components. Then of course we need to import that. So. Okay. So <clears throat> if we wanted to abstract this into a different class, basically we just want to allow the props to be passed in for setting like placeholder text and we want to emit certain events when things change. So the first thing I can do here for placeholder, I'm just going to say this will be placeholder. So up here I can say props, we have placeholder. And then inside projects we just simply pass Uh, placeholder is equal to whatever I just copied out. Let's see, this was my project is dot 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 or something like that. Um, this So this probably won't actually work out of the box because there's going to be errors. So before we make too much progress, let's just comment out things we don't want. So I can show you some progress. Let's see. Um, unfortunately, you can't really easily comment out crap, so I have to like cut it out or something. All right, so different approach. Let me just go ahead and make placeholder functions and stuff for all this, and then we can refactor as is. So we're passing in the placeholder text. That's awesome. Um, what we want to do is when the input text changes on this text field, instead of calling a function, we want to emit on input. And of course, make sure we pass that event. So now our existing component can just listen to that and call our function as needed. So let's go to here. We can say on input is equal to that new project name with whatever that was. So, okay. And then when the value is passed, they basically we need to have value as a prop too. So here I'm going to say value as a prop. And then instead of new project name, I'm going to say value. I'm going to go back to here. I'm going to pass value in. And then on key enter, instead of doing create project, we just want to say emit create. So then over here, we can just listen to the create event and just simply call create project. So we have that abstracted into a prop, this into a prop. And then on inputs, we pretty much emit on input with the passive event. And then for this one, when we hit enter, we're going to emit a create. There might be a shorthand to do this since we're just prop or yeah, propagating that event up. Maybe just pass it event or something. I'm not sure. So feel free to comment if there's a, is a better way to do line seven. Same thing with when we click on the button, we want to simply just emit create. And luckily our project's component is going to call create project on that already. Um, these are persistent, so we don't need to change those. So let's go ahead and save this and see what errors we may have. Let me refresh this page and see if we're getting any type of errors. It looks like we're not. So 
Notice that the prop is my project is, and we're passing that in here. Let me instead say my project name. And then when I type something, click create. Notice that it's doing the same logic as before. So it's sending off that event to create the project. Let me just refresh the page to make sure that's all persisting and working as it did before. So if you notice how easy it was to kind of abstract that little bit, bit of functionality into my own view component. And now basically anywhere in my app where I want to have something that looks like this, I could use it. And we're going to be using that in our tasks panel in just a second. Um, and before we move on, let me just make sure I align something to the right. So I'm going to say text small right. Because this create button should be as far to the right as possible. So for this other piece of functionality, which we're going to be using in the task panel, basically we want to create a new component and I'm going to call that editable record. Go ahead and scaffold that up and we're going to be doing the pretty much the exact same thing we did before. We're going to copy and paste this to editable record to bring it in. We're going to find that layout section and just copy and paste that into that editable record. So I'll paste that there. Boom. We're going to make sure we try to call it here. So editable record. And of course, make sure you bring it in inside your components. And save this and let's see what we should pass to it to make this work. So the first thing, the UI is going to be broken since we have to kind of fix all this stuff first. First thing we want to do is a prop to check to see if it's edit mode or not. So we are going to say bind is edit mode and we're going to pass it this. Change that to is edit mode. So that's going to be sending in the project that is edit mode. And then down here, of course, we need to define a props array. And just define is edit mode. We're just going to keep on going through and kind of doing the same thing. So instead of project.title here, let's make it a little bit more abstract. And that's just going to be title. So title. And then make sure that we're passing that in. So title is equal to project.title. Hmm. So this we can get rid of. Project.title we don't need. So we can just use title. Save project. Um, I'm going to, instead of doing project here, I'm going to call it record. So over here, I'm going to say record is a prop we pass in and anywhere we see project, I'm going to say record, record, record. Remember, get rid of is edit mode. It's not is edit mode. Um, The inputs, I'm going to say emit on input and pass it the event here. And then what we need to do in the file above is just listen to on input and we're going to call that same functionality. So set project title. This needs to be removed. Let's see. Okay, let's just look through this really quick and see if we're maybe missing anything. <clears throat> just add text right to this because I noticed in the UI it wasn't already aligned to the right. Right, so for these events, this abstract component, editable record, should have no idea if it's a project or a task or whatever. So instead, we need to say um, emit on edit. And then of course in here, we need to say on edit, dispatch that mutation. Same thing for this. Um, instead, we're gonna say emit on save. So basically when they click the save button, and we need to bind to that callback. So on save, make sure we call that previous method we were doing before. And then of course, getting kind of tedious. So I'm gonna say on delete. 
make sure that we find it to And that should say project for all the So if you notice here, basically this component has absolutely no knowledge about if it's a project or not. Uh, actually, this one needs to be emit on save instead of save project. All right, so you see no instance of project anywhere. And basically, this is just a very abstract component which, which takes in props and emits events when certain things happen, which the projects component is kind of responsible for changing and dispatching actions or emitting mutations. So let's see what potentially is still broken in the UI. So first of all, it looks like none of the titles are showing up. So we have title here, bound to project.title. Titles should be rendered here. And that should only edit or render when it's not edit mode. So that's probably the issue. Let me just refresh the page and see what errors we have. It looks like um, that might be working now. So let's just test it out and see if it's still working as it did before. Refresh the page. Boom. So we have now two abstract components which we can use in this task panel to basically edit tasks, delete tasks, save tasks, um, and create new tasks. And all we have to do is pass in certain props to do so. So let's just go ahead and commit what we have. I'm going to say editable records and create record components. Okay, so now for the kind of the last part of this um, tutorial, let's go ahead and finish out the implementation of that tasks panel. So if I go back to my projects.view view, view um, let's just assume we have one called tasks here. So we have a new component called tasks. I'm going to create that and make sure that exists in my components. And then I'm gonna make a new component called task.view, scaffold that up. Um, inside this, it's gonna be very similar to projects.view, uh, the other one. So let me go to this, see what we got. <clears throat> so similarly, we're gonna need a panel, but it's gonna have a title of tasks. Boom. So it seems like that's working fine. And inside that tasks panel, we're going to do something very similar where we're going to be looping over tasks. So I'm saying in our tasks in tasks or v4 task in task. I'm going to get the ID for the key. Just make sure that we grab this, but we're going to do a little bit smaller font size. So I'm going to do like 18 instead for a task. Then here I can just say task.description for now. <clears throat> Let's see what if has no matching. Uh, for some reason, it's not, uh, it must have been a fluke. It's working fine now. So let me just refresh the page in case we're getting in type of errors. Property method task is not defined on the end. It is okay. Alrighty. So now let's try to start implementing the store. So notice before we had a projects in the store, let's go and create something for the tasks. So in the store, I'm going to add a new one called tasks.js. And I'm just going to copy and paste projects and kind of print it down. So we have a good starting point. Let me get rid of all this. Let's name. 
Okay, so I created our tasks module. Make sure we include it here. So I'm going to say tasks and make sure you include that module in your main store object. So for the first thing we're doing, we just want to render over the tasks, right? Which that should be set up ready to go. Um, actually, it's not set up because we forgot to map the actions. So here, I'm going to go over and I'm going to copy this. We're going to be using a lot of the same map actions, mutations, and state. And what we want to do is inside of the computed, we want to call map state. That's going to take tasks and that's going to take tasks. This is obviously going to throw an error because we're not using this. So let me just get rid of those for now. Okay. So no more errors anymore. <clears throat> All right, so the first thing we want to do is if we go back to this component here and we click on one of these, we want to make sure that we set the current project that we're trying to edit. So going back to our projects module, let's go ahead and say Make a new mutation called set current project and state that project is equal to project just to keep track of what project we're kind of like clicked on. Call that current project instead of just project. Okay. So then in our projects.view, when we click on one of these editable records, so on click, we want to call set current project is equal to project. And of course, we haven't brought that in, so let's go and grab that mutation. And then for our editable record, we don't have an on click callback yet. So let's go here and let's go back to our title. And basically, if someone clicks it, I want to call on click. I want to omit on click so that we can keep track of what project we have clicked. So if I go back to my view um, debugger and click on some of these, notice that the current project is changing as I click different projects here. But we want to take that a, a step further. So basically set current project should probably be an action which fetches the tasks as well. So what we can do is in the tasks module, let's add a new action called fetch tasks for current project. That's going to be something that has a uh, mit, probably going to have root state. I'm going to call it set task for project and it's going to take a project as a second. So very similar to before, let's just grab the HTTP method here. And I'm going to just copy and paste that so we have something to work with. So that's going to fetch all of the tasks for this project ID that we're passing in for the action. And I'm going to say set task is equal to data and of course make sure that we have a mutation called set tasks state tasks this or I'm say state dot tasks is equal to tasks hmm. and then now when we actually click on a task we go back to projects when we call set current project what we want to do instead is make a new method called set current project. I'm sure I'm going to call it current project clicked. I'll call it project clicked. Sorry, I'm like changing my mind a lot. So what we want to do here is just say this dot 
set current project. We're going to pass it project. And we're also going to say this dot fetch tasks for project. And then make sure we just map the actions for tasks here. Uh, fetch tasks for project. Alrighty, so basically what we should have seen is if we click on that tasks over here, we click on a project, I mean, it should make two mutations. So it's going to first call set current project, which it is. And then it should make a request to the tasks, which I don't think it did. So let's kind of go back and debug why that might not be happening. Make sure we call it fetch tasks for project. It's an action and we should be able to call it correctly. So if I go back here, have an action here, project clicked. Oh, I know why. So we made this new function, but we didn't actually use it. So let's go back up here and call project clicked. And now when we click on this, notice that it makes a request for the tasks. This is going to return an empty array because we don't actually have any. And that should populate our tasks up here when it actually is defined. And we'll see that in a second. So let's go and start working on the next piece of functionality, which is going to be the create record. So if I go back to our task component, I'm just going to go ahead and add a create record section. Well, I need to dot dot dot, which is going to be like our task placeholder. A set new task when it's when the input changes, I'm going to say set new task name. Um, the value is going to be new task name and create is going to be create task. So very similar to the projects, but we need to make sure that we bring those in. So let's map new task name. And for methods, let's bring in map action from task. That's going to be called create task. And then we need some mutations, so mapping mutations. That's going to be called set new task name. And of course, those don't actually exist yet. So let's go back to tasks. And we need to create one called set new task name. State that new task name is equal to new task name. And then we need the whole create task here. So I'm just going to copy and paste basically what we have here and then edit it as needed. And the way we did it with the back end, I think we actually need the project. So what we can do is pretend like we have the project ID. I think it might be that. Let me just double check that I'm doing that right. Um, yeah, root state projects, current project that ID. So we're basically just grabbing that ID from the root state so we can know what tasks to append it to. Doing a post request, have the description here. We're calling append task, so make sure we have that task here. So I'm going to say state.tasks.push task as defined and let's see if this is all working forgot a comma here forgot Actions. Okay. Let's see how this works. All right, create record is not included, so make sure we also did components. 
and then make sure we include create record. Let me just copy and paste that import from the project. So, so here, make sure we import that, save it. Cool, so notice here in our tasks panel, we have the same pretty much component that we had over here, but it has a little bit different placeholder text. Now, if I type in clean my room, that's setting new task name, which is updating our task module, new task name here. And when I click create, we're getting an error. Um, and that's because, let's see, I don't think I clicked the project yet. So that's something we need to kind of fix. Basically, we shouldn't show this panel unless the current project is clicked. So if I go back to our projects view, and I grab map state, map state, and make sure that we are including current project. Basically, we don't want to display this section if we haven't selected a project yet. So if it is selected, we'll display it. Otherwise, we don't. OK, so now we shouldn't get that error because there's no way to actually create a task unless you've clicked one yet. So let's click on Awesome, and then let's try to create a task. Current project is selected of ID of 5. And now when I click Create, it should try to make a request to the task endpoint, which it did. That was successful. It returned a 200 status, and it sent back our task. And then we appended it to our tasks array. So at this point, what do we notice? Well, this is very similar to this over here. So let's go ahead and bring in that other component we created and try to reuse it. So if I go back to projects, I'm going to bring in editable record. Bring it in here, make sure it exists in my components. And I'm going to do very, very similar logic by just bringing that in. So editable record here. I'm going to go back to my task component. Instead of just displaying the description, let's display the editable record. And instead here, we're going to say task is edit mode. Task set task title. Task clicked. Actually, let's see what happens if I try to comment that out. Does it get an error? Yeah, I don't think it's going to work. So instead of title, we want to do description. We display clean my room. Uh, we don't want to do any logic when we click it, so let's just get rid of that. But the other logic should say fairly consistent. So let me go back and see if I can like. I have to be able to style that task in a second. But some things that we don't have yet is we don't have the set edit mode or save task or delete task created and set task description is not created yet. So let's just kind of work our way down these inputs and try to create what we need. So here I'm going to say a mutation of set task description. That's going to take a task in a description, basically say task.description to description. Make sure I rename title to description here. Um, set edit mode. So I'm going to go here, set edit mode, state task, and view.set. This is very similar to how we had it before, so let's just go ahead and copy that in. So just set edit mode here, and then make sure we include view from the top import. Then we also have save task. So let me just copy save project and delete project and just kind of change that as needed into our actions. So save task. I'm going to take a task. And then that's going to hit tasks, task.id, task. .id, task. 
task and delete task. Task, remove task. Forgot to bring in the unset edit mode, so I'm going to do unset edit mode. Maybe false. Okay, let's see if we're missing anything. You're missing remove task, so we need to make sure we that. State dot task dot by state dot tasks uh, index of task and one. All right, let's finally we need to bring these in. So we have these actions save task and delete task. So let's bring in delete task and save task. Set that task description is. Set edit mode is a mutation. And let's see if this works. So click on this. Let's see if we can edit the task. And that seems like it edited the task and saved it over here. Awesome. And then if we try to delete one of these new tasks here, make sure that that is working. So request failed with 404. And that's because we're trying to hit slash task when it needs to be tasks. So if I go back to my delete task method, I just need to add slash tasks instead. That, delete that. Okay, so that's basically all working as we did before. Oh, that's basically working as the projects did over here. And then we can also just change our projects as needed to fetch different tasks here. So I think the last thing I'm going to work on for this tutorial is um, putting a checkbox here so that I can mark a task as completed or not. So to do that, the first thing we want to do is kind of extend the existing editable record module that we have. Let me commit what we here. So I'm going to say All right, let me go back to this. So like I was saying, in the editable record, we want to be able to include a slot so that we can pass in the ability to render stuff to the left of our text fields in title <clears throat> or whatever it may be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new element called slot. And basically, whatever I pass in inside my projects or tasks component is going to render to the left of this text. So an example, if I go to tasks and then for my editable record, if I say, I'll do like H1, hello, make sure I have the closing tag outside of that and save this. We should say hello to the left. And of course, this is just going to be on top for right now because we're not floating it to the left or anything. But what we want to do in our case is I just want to make a checkbox. So kind of following what we've done over here, just get an icon. I'm going to go and put that inside the slot here. I'm going to just go ahead and get rid of that stuff for now and save this. And hopefully that is um, not what we're looking for. We're looking for something called a checkbox. So let me... Oh, sorry, I forgot to put an underscore here. Check underscore box. All right, so when we do that, we get a checkbox. But we need to be able to toggle between if, if it's a checkbox or if it's not filled out. So there's another um, icon that we could use called checkbox outline blank. So what we want to do here is basically just render some a different icon depending on if we're completed so i could say task dot completed 
and do a ternary operator and just simply return check box if we're completed or return check box outline blank if we are not completed. Go ahead and save that. If we go back, notice that these two tasks are not yet completed. <clears throat> Additionally, when we click on these check boxes, we want to kind of toggle that completed state. So let's just do that. Let's add a at click and I'll say toggle completed. And then that's going to be a method which accepts task. And of course, that doesn't exist here. So we need to go back to our uh, tasks and I'm going to say that's going to be an action. So I'm going to say toggle completed is an action. So we'll go back to our store, load up the tasks module. And I'm going to add a new one called toggle completed. And basically what this is going to do is we're going to do a commit to set that to either true or false. So I'm going to say toggle completed. Um, might have to have a different name. So actually I don't think it has to have a different name. So I'm going to do a mutation with the same name for now. I don't know if that's a good idea, but let's just do it. And basically task.completed is going to be equal to task.completed. And I do believe if we go to the console when we try to fetch tasks that completed is indeed a attribute on that task. So we should be good. We don't need to do view.set because we're actually handling that on the MySQL databases uh, table. So we have a mutation which is going to kind of modify or toggle that completed boolean. What we need to do inside this toggle completed action is simply commit that. Hmm. But after we've committed that, we need to call save task here. Um, and actually, instead of doing an action, maybe we should just instead get rid of this action. Sorry, kind of changing up my plans mid coding, which isn't necessarily bad to do. But instead of it being a action, let's just make it a mutation. And what we can do is when we click on this, I'm going to add a method down here called check clicked. I think that's what I just had it called. And we're simply just going to say this dot toggle completed task. And then I'm going to say this dot save task and pass that task. Check clicked, I think it's called. And I think I could have done this in the action. Um, like I could just fire an action off of dispatch an action from this action. But I think it gives us a little bit more flexibility if I don't actually save it when I toggle it. So I want the mutation to just toggle the state and then I want this component to be responsible for saving it. I don't want the action to do both of that. So let's see if this works. So if I go and click on my project here and I click on this task here, first of all, it's sending off a request to the network and completed is true. Um, if I go to my view X or view slash um, debugger, we see that toggle completed was fired. Completed is set to true. If I click it again, completed is set to false and it's saving that task. So let me just make a couple of tasks and make sure that these get persisted when I create them. And just refresh the page just to verify that everything is working as um, before. And it is. Okay, so. We're basically at the end of our demo. I mean, I could probably spend more time sprucing up the styles. You know, obviously when I hover over this, it should be clickable or it should have a cursor when I hover over this. The text should change. Um, but I guess in terms of this tutorial, I don't want to spend too much extra time polishing this up. I think we covered a lot of good grounds and like examples of how to build up a single page application and connect it to a REST API that we created by hand. So that basically wraps up this full stack view and Adonis JS tutorial. If you have any feedback or questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below, or you can message me on Twitter. Um, I could always use feedback if this tutorial was too quick or if I was jumping all over the place. Um, feel free to tell me so, and maybe I'll make another tutorial in the future, which isn't so sporadic and on the fly. I personally like tutorials that are kind of like um, 
unplanned so you can kind of see what I'm thinking and how my logic is applied to when I'm making applications and stuff. All right, so I think that's basically what I'm going to be covering in the full stack tutorial other than deployment, which I'll do in a bit. One thing I'll change is if you remember, if we go back to our store and go to the index, I disabled a plugin called create, create persisted state. I'm just going to re-enable that and kind of explain what this does. Basically, now when I refresh the page, I have to log in one more time, but now when I refresh the page, it's going to cache everything that was in my store inside local storage, meaning that I don't have to log in again or whatnot. So basically, exactly how I have my app state before I leave and refresh, that's how it's going to load back up. So if you notice, I clicked on this project and it loaded back up for me. Um, <clears throat> so it's very useful in terms of like UX because you don't want a user to have to keep logging in over and over again. Just have their state stored locally and then once they refresh the page or go back onto the application, everything is exactly how it was before. So in order to get our single page application deployed out, we first need to kind of build it. So I'm going to do npm run build in the client folder. And that's going to build our view application into a dist folder. And after that's done building, what we could simply do is just copy it from the disk folder and put it in our public folder in our server. Again, that's probably not the you know proper or best practice way to do it, but that's just one way to deploy your application and it's super simple. So while that's doing that, I'm just gonna build a new folder called public. Okay, so now that that is done, if you look at the disk folder here, it created a bunch of different files. So basically what I'm gonna do is just copy the files that are in that folder and put them in my public folder here. And I just want to make sure that the public folder is not ignored. Um, again, this this probably isn't the best way. You should probably have like a continuous integration, continuous deployment system building up and deploying to like a static host like S3 or something. But again, this is just a quick, dirty way to get it deployed. So. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to simply add that and commit it. Then push that to my repo. And then on our Git repo, we can simply pull and start our Adana server to have that hosted. All right, so now for deploying this application, first thing I'm going to show you is uh, I have a DigitalOcean account and I'm going to create a new droplet. So if I go up here and click, click droplet, uh, create droplet. It's going to give us a list of uh, different OSs we can use. I'm just going to use Ubuntu, which is the default. I'll just go ahead and say, give me the default because I'm only going to have this hosted for like a minute or, or a couple of minutes. And then when I click, click uh, create, that's going to go ahead and just start creating my droplet. And then once it's done, I'm going to get an email with the root password that I can use. Also, we have the IP up here that we can use to SSH into the machine. So let's give this a second to finish running. All right, so now that this is done running, let's just go ahead and copy that IP address and go over to my terminal. I'm going to do SSH root at that IP address. And then I'm going to copy and paste the password that they've emailed to me, for the root password. And then once you first log in for the first time, it's going to ask you for that current password again. It's going to ask you to enter a new password. Let me, let me do that. And now we are on the server. So the first step is we want to install Node. So let's go ahead and just follow this tutorial where it says you need to curl the setup eight script. So I'll run that. And that's going to fetch the necessary things, the setup node. And then when that's done, you need to go ahead and run the second command. So that's done. I'm going to run install for Node.js. All right, so now we have Node installed and we have npm installed. So before we move on, we need to also make sure we install the Adonis CLI. So let me just go ahead and copy that, run that. Basically, we need that for running our migration scripts. So while that's installing, let's just go ahead and set up the next step, which is we need to go to our project and go ahead and copy the HTTPS link here. So I'm going to copy that. And we're going to clone our project when this is done installing. 
So I'm going to do git clone and clone our project. Now we have our project here. I'm going to SSH into the server folder, or I'm going to CD into the server folder and run npm install so that I install all of our dependencies we need to host our Adana server. And while that's installing, I'm just going to edit this env file. And in order to host our Adana server, we need to change a couple of things. So first of all, the host needs to be 0000, port needs to be 80, and then node env needs to be production. All the rest you can keep as is. So I'm just going to copy this. And inside that server folder here, I'm going to paste that into that .env file. Save that. Um, and now we can run our migration scripts. So we're going to do Adonis migration colon run hyphen hyphen force. Make sure we run our migration scripts and set up our tables. In fact, it might have already set that up. Maybe I committed. Yeah, the database was committed when I the database file the SQLite was already committed to the um the repo, so that was kind of my bad. So technically you don't need to run your migration scripts. Um this should have been ignored, get ignored. But if it wasn't or yeah, if it was get ignored, you probably have to rerun your migration scripts to set up your SQLite. So now everything at this point is set up. Let's just try running our server really quick and make sure that it runs using node space server.js. And if everything worked, it should say it's hosted on 00080. Then we can go up here and try to go to local. Or we can try to go to the IP address here. Just hit it and see what happens. And so our app is now loaded. It's hosted at this port on, or it's hosted at this IP port 80. We can see that our app is running. Make sure that we can actually log in. Let's just click log in and see what happens. And it successfully successfully logged us into our app. Cool. So I mean, basically, you just follow these steps if you wanted to get your app running in production. Um. And of course, you can use other things like Heroku or Cloud Compute to deploy your application, but that's just, this is just one way to do it really quickly and really cheaply because you can have a lot of apps running on the same droplet. And the setup wasn't too difficult. Uh, the final step is we probably want to install a better way to run our server. So let's install a tool called PM2 globally. So npm install global PM2. And once that's done installing, I could just do pm2 start server.js. And that is going to be a tool which kind of monitors my server and will restart it if it were to crash for whatever reason. So that's done installing. Now I can do pm2 start server.js. That's going to spawn a pm2 daemon on my server. So I can hit it again here. Here it's loading fine. Cool. So that pretty much sums up my full stack view Adonis digital ocean deployment tutorial. If you have any comments and you want to leave me feedback of how I can make my tutorials better, feel free to do so in the comments below. I hope this tutorial didn't go too quick and I hope I kind of explained what I was doing. In the meantime, happy coding and thanks for watching.